Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our school board meeting, November 3rd. Um, I would like to call this meeting to order. And if you will please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you very much. And if you will join us um, with the Pledge of Allegiance for it. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, will you please um, call roll? Yes, Madam Chair, Mr. Bryant. Ms. Bryson Morsberger. Here. Ms. Dooley. Here. Dr. Kraft. Present. Ms. McKeever. Here. Mr. Morris. Yes. Ms. Torres. Yes. And our student rep, Ms. Bird. Here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And may I have a motion for approval of our agenda, please? I, I second it. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. We now have our first opportunity for comments from members of the community. If you or anybody here in the media center would like to make a comment, you may um, approach the mic and, and you have three minutes to make that comment. We do offer another opportunity at the end of the meeting. Is there anybody online who would like to make comment at this point? All right, so we are right here um, at an opportunity for members of the community and I see a couple of people walking in. Would anybody like to make comment? Huh. Please state your name, your address, and you have three minutes. Thank you. First off, I don't want this to go against my three minutes. People can't get in. So you all got to figure out how to get that door situation straight. Because it took me and a, a principal from Buford a while to get through the door. So the doors are locked. Um, number one, I'm here for a volleyball issue. I'm speaking on behalf of um, Nakia Washington, Ashley Bellamy, Jackira, Nakira, and Layla. Um, we dealt with a volleyball issue here and they emailed the school board and um, you all were notified of the issue on the school board. What happened was everybody was terminated. That's a safe move. Um, my main concern is that the girls felt like they were being singled out by a white coach. And I did a little homework. Um, let me go back because I didn't introduce myself to Nisha Hudson, but I'm pretty sure 90% uh, of the people in here already know me. Um, we met, I have a recording and I wanna play certain parts of this recording, but I wanna say terminating everybody was a safe move. You had three black girls complain about a white coach and I did a little bit of homework. Um, and the homework that I done was I looked at every single travel team on volleyball in this area, this entire area, every single school system. And every single high school team is filled with 95% of these coaches travel team, which means that normal girls who have normally played Ruth White and William White daughter being one for Charlottesville High School, she was cut. Why was she cut? She was cut because Coach Megan wanted her travel team. This is happening everywhere. Charlottesville, Albemarle, Western Albemarle, Fluvanna, Louisa, you name it. You look at these calves, 
volleyball travel teams, you look at these area travel teams for volleyball and you look at the high school team, more than 60 to 70% of the high school team makes up the travel team. That's not coincidental. That's just a new way for these coaches to get extra practice time because we have a facility shortage here in Charlottesville. And we know that with basketball, that there's not enough gym space for people to practice around here. That's issue number one. Issue number two was in this meeting, if people were interested in really knowing the truth, was that these young ladies felt like they were being singled out and this lady was literally picking little points to say about them. The hair bow wasn't strong enough to hold their hair. They weren't up to a certain standard. I went to the school. I play sports at the school. The varsity coach rarely came to talk to the JV coach. Coach Terrell never told Gary Bloxham how to run his program. Gary Bloxham ran Gary Bloxham program. Coach Terrell ran his program. When you got to Coach Terrell, you play like Coach Terrell. When you were on JV, you play like Gary Bloxham. So intimidating these young three black girls and then them going to their black coach, Coach Lex, expressing that they felt like this coach singled them out. Even their white teammates pointed out that they were being singled out. Everybody was terminated and let go, even Coach Lex. So now you violate in your anti-racism policy. You've opened up the door for an OCR complaint. And you've even opened up a door for a Title IX complaint because now you have three little black girls that don't feel safe to say, this white coach is talking to me any type of way and I go express it to a black coach and this lady loses her job and that's the only outlet that I have. Is that the example that we wanna set in Charlottesville City Schools? Cause I don't think any of y'all ran on those platforms. I don't think any of y'all believe in that. I don't think you formed that anti-racism policy to allow this to happen. This was wrong. This was all the way wrong. And you don't have race issues just in Charlottesville High School on the volleyball team. You have race issues even happening at Buford Middle School with teachers. Telling a little child, do you, did you bring a shank to school? First off, a shank, that is prison language. A seventh or eighth grader does not know what a shank is. That's prison language. It's so much going on in these school systems. And a lot of it is being hidden and it's not coming out to the public. The mom is trying to get in right now. So I don't know if y'all can send somebody to the door, but uh, one of the moms is here and I know she wants to speak as well. Thank you. But this is a serious issue that needs to be addressed and how it was handled was really wrong. Terminating people and taking people jobs when you haven't addressed the initial issue of race is a real problem. Terminating people when you have yet to do the investigation, and this was the lady that did the investigation, when you have yet to investigate how many of those kids were on that travel team, and that was one of the main issues that mom brought to the table, that was wrong. Ms. Hudson, your, your time is up, please. Thank you. Is there another public comment or I got to come back? There to the is, next meeting. No, there is one at the end of the meeting. Okay. Thank you. I think we'll wait just a minute here and see if a parent is on our way in.
Okay, I think we're going to proceed at this point, and there is another opportunity towards the end of the meeting for um, public comment again. All right, may I have a motion, please, for adoption of our consent agenda? So moved. Second by Mr. Bryant. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Gurley has a quick announcement. Yes, um, so I do want to uh, recognize some individuals. Uh, we try to recognize our new hires um, and so uh, some of our administrative new hires. And I wanted to make sure I start with Ms. Holly Russell. I inadvertently left you off last month. So I want to make sure that I recognize her. Um, so if you could stand for us. Uh, Ms. Russell, um, she comes to us from uh, Fort Defiance um, High School um, most recently, and where she was an admin intern. Um, she was an English teacher. She is, um, she is currently serving as an assistant principal at uh, Buford Middle School. And I know that Mr. Jordan said that she's come in and she's hit the ground running and done a great job. So we do want to welcome you uh, to Charlottesville City Schools. My apologies for the delay. Uh, next, I want to next, next I want to recognize uh, Dr. Tanya Coffey. She is our uh, science coordinator. Um, Dr. Coffey comes with an extensive background. Most recently, she served as a curriculum developer and facilitator for um, Code VA. Um, she served for many years as an instructional technology resource um, teacher. Uh, I know she's come in now and she's met with all of our principals, working very closely with our teachers in terms of um, in terms of uh, developing our um, and revamping our science curriculum. Um, so we do welcome her uh, to Charlottesville City Schools. Next, we have Mr. Um, Jeffrey Ernie. Uh, Mr. Ernie is our new um, is our new human resources coordinator, uh, and he. Uh, as well comes to us with an extensive background in um, human resource management, um, workman's compensation, recruiting, um, done um, just a plethora of things. And I know yesterday he assisted the team with the uh, facilitation of the flu shot. So already um, coming again, doing a lot of the um, doing a lot of the work. And I know that the team has raved just to have another person on the team to do some of that work with them. So we welcome you um, as well. Thank you. And um, lastly, um, this evening, we have Mr. Andy Jones. Uh, he is our new director of student activities and athletics. Uh, Mr. Jones is um, has been with us for a very long time and served in uh, many capacities from instructional coach to instructional technology resource teacher. Um, he's also taught here, uh, done a, a couple different roles over at Buford Middle School, and so and and currently already uh, serving in uh, the capacity of the direct in the capacity of DSA. So thank you, Mr. Um, Jones, for leaning in there. Just wanted to welcome you all, so we could give all of our new hires um, a round of applause. And just want to let you all know that when you're here, you are family. Thank you. Thank you and welcome everybody. All right, we're moving on to our um, action item for the evening. All right, Dr. That'll be my, that will be me. Madam Chair, school board members, uh, good evening. So I want to um, bring before you, this is the um, second reading of this. We had the first reading uh, during, our, um, during our work session uh, for the um, one-time bonus. So just wanted to give you all, just wanted to remind you of the background um, that the General Assembly in, 2000, in the 2022-2024 biennium budget included a distribution to school divisions uh, for a one-time uh, one payment. 
Um, the state is using ARPA funds to distribute uh, $414,000, approximately $414,000 to Charlottesville City to cover 300 and, uh, 385 um, full-time equivalent positions. And so just want to keep in mind that we um, employ, we employ over that number, uh, we employ um, 793 full-time equivalents. And we do think that it is beneficial to, uh, to give all of our employees that one-time bonus, not just the one time, not just the employees that are covered um, by the, uh, the um, funds that are given from the state. Um, I know that we had a question. There was a question that was posed um, as with regards to where we would get the additional funds. And so we did receive confirmation since the time we posted this that we are able to use ARPA funds instead of using our fund balance. So we will be use, we are authorized to use ARPA funds to cover the one time um, to cover the one time bonus. And so what we will do is the bonus, what we're proposing is that the, um, the bonus will be paid in a separate check on the December 1st net, uh, which will include all payroll taxes and supplemental pays required by the, IR, uh, by the IRS. So um, what we will need, if, you, if you know, pending any questions you all may have, what we will need this evening is for you um, to approve us to use the 430, to use up to $439,406 to um, fund the shortfall of the additional monies needed to cover the other um, FTEs for the one-time bonus. And in that recommendation, the money will come from the um, ARPA funds, not fund balance. So moved. Second. Any questions or further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And thank you for looking into that. Thank you. And Appreciate I know it. our employees will be excited about the one-time bonus. Thank you. All right. We will move on to items for discussion. All right. We uh, will have Ms. Powell to introduce um, our presenters for the en Energy and Water Performance Report. Yes, good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Gurley, and members of the board. We're very happy to have with us again this evening uh, Jill Greiner and Kirk Vizier from uh, the City Sustainability Office. They're going to talk to you about how that office works together with us and our teachers and everything they do with our buildings and even the programs and activities that touch our students. So um, at this time, I'll turn the podium over to Kirk and Jill. Good evening. Uh, I'm Kirk Vizier, uh, the Energy Management Coordinator for the city, and uh, my colleague Jill Greiner is here, and she's the Water Efficiency Program Coordinator for the city. Uh, we both work together to deliver and facilitate the city's energy and water management program. Uh, this emphasizes improving energy and water efficiency throughout city and school facilities uh, that crosses over about 70 municipal sites. Um, today, we'd like to give you an overview of the Charlottesville City Schools performance from the City of Charlottesville's fiscal year 2022 annual energy and water performance report. It's a mouthful. Um, the report is uh, actually just was just finalized, and so we want to highlight some of the uh, pieces of the report that focus on uh, Charlottesville City Schools. Thank you, Kirk, for the introduction. Uh, so here, I just wanted to give you a little timeline of our energy and water management efforts. Uh, it started all in 2006 when we established our Green City vision. 
And then that carried into um, some really in, uh, great achievements when the schools had six of their buildings Energy Star certified. Uh, also uh, in 2016, the schools were recognized as a green ribbon school. Uh, in 2018, we did formally establish our energy and water management program, although we have been doing efforts previously. Uh, and then in 2019, we did establish an energy and water uh, performance resolution with you all. And that carried into um, all of our great efforts from then. And um, we're you know, really excited about this partnership that we've uh, developed. We uh, meet annual, or sorry, not annually, um, monthly with uh, the administration and also quarterly with the principals to discuss um, all of our efforts and performance goals. So uh, in this presentation, we're gonna be reporting some of the highlights from our FY 2022 uh, Energy and Water Performance Report. And we're gonna be highlighting some of the school's specific actions and results. The report incorporates three focus areas. We've got operations, technology, and people, and, uh, and how these all interact and influence our performance. And you can view our full report on our website, um, and that is listed on the bottom here, and that has also executive summaries and an interactive dashboard with all the data that's included in the report. Um, so we're gonna go into a little bit more detail about the operational side. So um, the uh, operations is actually a very important component of schools when it comes to the uh, energy and water manager program. Uh, it actually involves delivering actions at minimal cost, but can actually have the largest impact on energy and water usage. Uh, just the way we operate our buildings has actually a lot more impact in some cases than just having efficient equipment in there. So you want to pair that as much as possible with the technology that we're going to be putting in there. Uh, our program's goal with operations is to have schools run as efficiently as possible within the needs of the users at the school. We continue to meet with CCS administrative staff in FY22 uh, and to monitor utility usage monthly and reported questions or concerns to the appropriate staff for further investigation. This monitoring is important to stay on top of leaks or excessive operations driving up energy and water usage that otherwise likely go unnoticed. Monitoring of HVAC schedules, as well as communication between school staff and the facility maintenance team about HVAC needs continue to be a major piece of managing energy and water usage in our schools, uh, certainly throughout uh, 2020, 2021, definitely during COVID, uh, but certainly now that we're coming out of COVID and things are changing a little bit, uh, I say coming out of COVID, but operations have returned to somewhat normal. Uh, we really have to stay on top of the operations and coordinating those HVAC schedules appropriately. So we're only operating when people are in the buildings and not when they're not uh, needing HVAC. At Walker Upper Elementary, uh, load shedding is actually something that we programmed into the building automation system, which involves uh, actually dropping the non-critical systems, lowering that load throughout the day when you hit a peak demand, usually in the afternoons. Uh, the building automation system actually detects how much we're using. And if we're reaching a critical level, it will actually shut down certain systems that are, when I say non-critical, it's not shutting off a bunch of HVAC systems. It's more like lights in certain areas or you know, equipment that's not necessarily being used fully for that moment. Um, it'll pull that into a setback mode and will actually reduce the energy usage, uh, capping out what we're using at that time. And that actually helps reduce energy usage as well as the peak energy costs that we pay throughout the day. So that's something we've implemented at Walker Upper Elementary, and we're actually looking to uh, put that across a number of schools through the building automation systems. Uh, the aim for FY23 will be to continue implementing a number of these operational measures and expand where possible to minimize any of the wasted energy and water that we have through operations. On the technology side, we just wanted to highlight a few things. Um, technology actions focus primarily on the improvements made to school buildings, so the things you're probably going to see, like lighting uh, for the most part, but also the HVAC systems and the things running behind the scenes. Um, technology actions in FY22 included upgrading lighting to LED, replacing HVAC equipment, and upgrading building automation systems, which are important for controlling and monitoring building HVAC systems and lighting. Uh, it's basically the control center for our buildings. So uh, if we get a more advanced system in place, that means we can do a lot more with it uh, to make programming that actually reduces, sort of does this energy, uh, this demand limiting uh, and these other sort of advanced energy efficiency programming that we can do with those advanced systems. Um, 
We are also pursuing opportunities to assist with funding these improvements. So these include participating in a rebate program through the PJM grid, uh, which gives us essentially money back for implementing projects. So those that reduce energy usage on the grid, they'll actually pay us to uh, a, a basically over about four years, we get a payment every quarter that we can then reinvest into projects. And so we participate in that program uh, for projects at CHS as well as other uh, city buildings. We're also looking into uh, the energy uh, performance contract, which I'll also get into. Um, as we move into FY23, we're excited to say that we are reviewing projects identified through the energy performance contract process, and we're working on the next steps that would help deliver essential upgrades at lighting, water fixtures, as well as potential HVAC improvements at school facilities. These would be implemented over a period of years and would be a major step in meeting the goals laid out in the municipal part of the city's climate action plan. So I'll turn it over to Jill for the next step. Um, we can't forget about people when it comes to building performance. Uh, people are a really important role in uh, our facilities, energy and water performance. It's how they interact with the buildings and its fixtures, and also just the number of people in those buildings can really have a significant impact on our utility usage. The Energy and Water Management Program has identified the need to connect the people to the facilities that use them, and so we do that with education and communication to support this connection. Our program works with the schools to develop quarterly educational campaigns each year centered around clear energy and water saving messages. Listed here on the slide, you can see our educational campaigns for FY 2022, and they're all focused around the academic theme of turning actions into savings. We also work with classes and grades directly. Uh, a couple examples is our delivering 370 climate action kits with the help of uh, community partners, Community Climate Collaborative and the Virginia Discovery Museum uh, to the fifth graders at Walker Elementary. Uh, we also worked with an, a fourth grade class at Greenbrier on their Think Global, Act Local le uh, lesson where they presented us their energy and water saving ads. We um, also are trying to reach our school staff by um, conveying our energy and water saving efforts. This winter and also in previous winters, we put out uh, messages around eliminating the use of space heaters in schools as these can be unsafe and also cause hot and cold issues in the buildings. Uh, looking forward to FY23, we are going to be continuing our education and outreach efforts at the schools with our quarterly education uh, materials. And also we're in the process of rolling out a really uh, cool pilot program at Burnley Moran Elementary. They're going to be light switch reminders. Uh, so we're really excited to get that rolling. Switching away from the actions and uh, that impact our energy water usage, we're going to go into a little more detail about how our buildings are performing. We actively monitor all of our school facilities, looking for trends, um, issues, and successes when it comes to our performance. We found in FY22, we are getting close to, I will say, a normal or a pre-pandemic year for our schools as our building occupancy was up significantly from the previous fiscal year, and buildings were being run close to normal schedules. FY 2022 usage and costs were higher than FY 2021 when building occupancy was low and many of our schools were closed for some period of time. FY 2022 school portfolio sp uh, spent 1.26 million on energy and water utilities, which is in line with our average pre-pandemic utility costs. Overall, we are seeing a slight increase to our school utility spending over time. Uh, this is partly due to rising utility rates, but also as a result of increases in our school utility usage. And to now focus more on our usage, um, overall our utility usage at the schools is increasing, as I mentioned, when compared to our FY21, except for natural gas. These increases in electricity and water are in line with increases in building occupancy in our schools, as well as the schools being run at more of our pre-pandemic schedules and are actually being run even longer. And this is mostly to support the need for increased airflow for some COVID mitigation strategies. In addition, uh, each year the city does significant amount of construction and renovation projects to one or two schools, uh, typically during the summer, and these construction projects can cause significant increases in our utility usage uh, at the schools and uh, also afterwards while we're trying to adjust and optimize the systems. Natural gas did decline in usage, and this is likely to have more of an impact because of the people in these buildings that are providing actually body heat, which offsets the need to uh, heat these schools and these, these spaces. 
Uh, when comparing our usage to our baseline year of FY15, we actually see a uh, increase in utility usage across all of them. Our goal is to uh, have our school utility usage decline 2% annually. We are working toward making these utility usage goals, but hopefully when exploring avenues such as our energy performance contract, we can start seeing more progress at meeting our reduction goals. So one of the main metrics that we also look at besides just the energy usage and water usage is our benchmarking scores through Energy Star's portfolio manager. Uh, Energy Star scores are a score from one to 100. Uh, it's the higher, the better. So the closer you are to 100, the more efficient uh, it seems that your, your uh, facility is compared to other facilities across the nation. Scores are developed by taking space attributes of facilities. So square footage, number of people, double, number of occupants, the operating hours, as well as the energy usage at that facility. And it uses that to actually calculate the score from one to 100. 75 is the minimum score needed to pursue an Energy Star certification for each school. So that's typically a target that we want to try to hit. Um, after a period of increased scores in FY21, mainly due to the low, lower occupancy that we had throughout the schools, we're now kind of seeing a rebound where uh, everything's starting to normalize at FY22. So we're seeing those scores drop just a little bit, uh, which is expected and we, we knew was probably going to be happening. Uh, but it's more of a reflection of actual performance of the schools. Um, as you can see, Johnson Elementary and Lugo McGinnis Academy are both above the 75 prerequisite and are now eligible to apply for Energy Star certification. We are confirming all the data for these, and then we'll look to start the certification process in uh, FY23. So we're excited to get that rolling as soon as we get that data uh, confirmed and, and ready to go. Uh, as you can see, we actually have a number of schools that were Energy Star certified in 2009. And uh, we're looking to go ahead and recertify as it's gotten even more difficult uh, as the nation's buildings have gotten more efficient. It's actually harder to get a, an Energy Star score at a higher level because of that comparison. So it's not that we've been doing poorly and our scores have dropped. It's literally that it's just hard to stay to keep up with the nation uh, getting more efficient. So um, the, the scores being above a 75 is really good, uh, is really something that we want to try to hit and it's really kind of a, uh, something that's great to see for at least a couple of our schools within the portfolio. Um, on the greenhouse gas emissions piece, we wanted to just touch quickly on what's happening with uh, the building operations and how it's affecting our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we saw an 8.9% increase over FY 2021, which was again to be expected. Uh, schools are still showing a significant reduction from our 2015 facility performance baseline and the 2011 overall Charlottesville greenhouse gas reduction goal baseline. So that's a community-wide baseline is 2011. Uh, so we're showing some significant reductions since that, and that's definitely what we wanna see. Um, right now, that, that certainly plays a part with the grid becoming a little bit more clean that plays into this as well, but also what we're doing on site. So um, it's, it's all of that is playing into that, into that greenhouse gas reduction. So looking to FY23, just what we wanted to kind of say a few notes about what we're going to be doing as well. Uh, the portfolio will still have an elevated base energy usage uh, due to the new ventilation operations for COVID-19 mitigation measures. We'll continue to review utility performance monthly and investigate opportunities to improve efficiency through operations, technology, and the behavior strategies that we mentioned. With the development of the city's climate action plan, the EWMP, uh, Energy and Water Management Program, is working to develop clear utility reduction goals for CCS facilities that are in line with the city of Charlottesville's greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. The city is actively evaluating project management capacity and funding, whether through internal funding sources, through a power purchase agreement, federal dollars, or uh, in the energy performance contract uh, that is necessary to move forward with the installation of solar on city and school facilities. We'll be working to finalize the development of the energy performance contract after, re after reviewing the audit reports provided by the ESCO. Uh, this will include determining the energy and water conservation measures that are going to be included in the final project, how to phase in that work across the city and school portfolios, and specific funding approaches to use throughout the contract. Again, this is an important part of the municipal portion of the climate action plan to achieve the targeted greenhouse gas reductions. 
Thank you for your time today. Uh, we just uh, wanted to point you to, again, to the website uh, on here where you could find the full report. I will say it's around 40 to 45 pages. So uh, we do have some executive summaries specifically for the city portfolio as a whole, as well as the schools uh, uh, specifically. So uh, feel free to go there and, and uh, read and see what you can see what you ask us or let us know if you have any questions about it as well. Um, we're happy to answer questions now if uh, you have any. Thanks. Thank you, board members, any questions? Student, Allison, no? Mr. Bryant, questions? Dr. Kraft. Yeah, um, thank you for all of this information. Um, I was wondering if uh, you were gonna be um, going into one of our schools that maybe needs to improve their um, energy star, well, potential, whatever it is, um, what would you tell them to do differently? Uh, from a behavior perspective? Yes, uh -huh. just the people. The, the main thing as we're, as we're doing with, uh, with these uh, light switch reminders is to just turn off lights for the most part, because that's one of the easiest things you can do uh, while you're in these facilities is to actually shut things off when you don't need them. Um, that lighting hits about 20, between 20 and 30% of a total building's energy usage. So you will see a significant reduction if you actually shut things off appropriately. Um, we do find that some lights are actually staying on even at CHS longer than they need to, just because of uh, the way things are programmed in the building automation system. Things are outside the, per the people's control, but in some cases you do have it where we are leaving lights on and we don't need to. Um, the other thing I think is to just make sure that we're uh, the facility and our faculty and staff are actually still communicating well with our facilities maintenance team about what needs you have as far as activities for HVAC. Um, if we're having something after school, let's not go ahead and program that for the entire week if it's only needed for a day. Let's make sure we tell, tell them an actual stop time, not just the start time that you need it. Um, and so that's, those are important pieces that we wanna make sure that communication is happening. Uh, when you let HVAC run, a long time that actually has a, a really major impact, especially if you just program it and forget it. Uh, they're, they're called rogue schedules in the, in the BAS talk. And that's something that we wanna try to just uh, pull out as much as possible and make sure that we address. So. Ms. Dooley. So, Mr. Morris. So just for clarification, the, the um... LED lighting for CHS, is that scheduled to happen soon? The, the upgrade to, uh, to, LED, uh, to LED lighting? Yes, I'm, I'm speaking, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm looking That's over okay. here. I, know. <laughs> I, I was like, I didn't know what you were. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> That's okay. Um, um, so the upgrade to LED lighting would be part of the energy performance contract. And right now we are evaluating when to phase that in. I would say that the actual start of work from the energy performance contract wouldn't happen until uh, certainly FY24 was when that would start to, to actually phase in. We are trying to, to tackle the lighting and water fixture upgrades at about the same time, and so that would be a phase unto itself. So I would say it would, it would, it would certainly be over the next, it would it'd be at least a year away probably potentially up to two years to see when that phases and that starts. But we are, again, working through the financial pieces uh, to budget through CIP, as well as other mechanisms uh, to actually fund that and get that rolling quickly, so. Okay, I just felt like that was something we, I know we had talked about it a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it actually made the list, but I'm glad it Absolutely, to... in fact, that's one of the low hanging fruit that's, that I guess you could say that um, when you're looking at the overall cost and payback for these projects, lighting is essentially what you do first because it helps to fund everything else because it just is such a great payback. So that's a no brainer to do that first and to bundle that with everything else. So. Okay, great. And then just out of curiosity, when we're looking at performance energy stars and comparing the different schools. So what is it about Johnson that has them performing at that higher level? Do you know? That's a great question. Um, so at Johnson, they do have a new BAS that was installed that has certainly helped them, but they've actually had a, a, a pretty good score for a number of years now, um, since even prior to that BAS being installed. Um, over there, I know that, that we, they have been really good at keeping the HVAC communication going. And that, is a not, that happens in everywhere, but I think specifically, I know 
um, they're really on top of trying to maintain that. And um, I would say that it's it's hard to pinpoint exactly why they're doing so well compared to the others. When you but say when you say they're doing a really good job, who's they? Johnson, uh, the, just the Johnson uh, school in general. So okay. the facilities maintenance team, the faculty, everyone that influences energy usage at this at this facility. So okay. yep, it's not just one group. Um, but um, um, I don't have a very clear answer for that. I think that's a great question. It's something we sh we should certainly try to look into a little further, but what we wanna make sure is they're continuing the best practices that they're doing right now. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, again, making sure the HVAC is running only when it needs to. Um, the, the lighting is not all LED. There's definitely opportunities that can happen there. So it will get some improvement even when you do an LED upgrade there. So um, that's, that's something that even when you are at that level, there's still, still ways to improve. So we'll, we'll, be, we'll be looking to have that happen. Certainly when CHS gets, gets included in that, the rest of the schools as well are likely going to be part of that whole portfolio upgrade. So we'll, we'll see a, a notable increase in the scores I would suspect after that is done. And then lastly, sorry, um, there was something on here about solar. So what, what do you have in plans or what's in line for solar? So for us? right now, so interestingly, CHS is one of the biggest solar producers that we have. Um, it's uh, the, the CHS actual, it's a solar installation that we have is one of the ones that produces the most capacity across all the ones we have in the city. Um, we're working to time, not just here, but at other schools as well, time that with roof replacement schedules. So right now we are coordinating with that to make sure that when we put a new roof on, we're then bundling solar with that and then uh, phasing it in through that approach. We are still investigating the financing pieces. So it's not just what we have within the city through uh, funding internally. We're looking at a power purchase agreement to see if we can uh, possibly look into more of a, um, I would, I wouldn't necessarily be a lease, but something where we would pay back over time and we could get them installed and then actually have that uh, without having such a big outlay at the beginning. Uh, that's all a part of, I guess you could say the larger climate action planning as well. So all of that's being discussed right now. And, and I think, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, the, um, just the project management on our side to support putting in some of these things is something that we're trying to work with on the staff time. Um, that's where getting a power purchase agreement or another group to come in and do this installation uh, or go through the energy performance contract where a contractor will come in and actually manage that. That's something that's very advertising to us. It's something that does solve that problem. So we're evaluating those right now to figure out how we want to approach that. So. Great, thank you. Appreciate you guys coming. Sure. All right, we will have um, Ms. Tatum. Uh, Ms. Tatum will do our literacy update. Good evening, board chair, members of the board, Dr. Gurley. Y'all hear me? Yeah. Tonight, I will share some updates on our literacy data, the implications, and what we are doing differently. <clears throat> this presentation will include K2 literacy data from the VLP, the Virginia Literacy, literacy Partnership, which is what we used to call PALS. They've changed their name. Um, that data will be spring 2019, spring 2000 through spring 2022. That's going to show the impact of COVID. I'm going to share our current fall VLP literacy data for K through two, our reading map growth data for grades four through eight, and fall map data for grade three. I'll talk about implications and impact of this data and share some specific action steps that we are doing differently. And finally, our next steps. So apologies in advance, I am gonna talk through this data quite specifically because when I put data in front of you, I wanna make sure you understand it and give it context. So the VLP, formerly known as PALS office, released a report to help us visualize and understand the impact of, that COVID has had on our K2 literacy achievement. These next two slides, this one and the next one, will include tables directly from that VLP report. The top graph shows the percentage of students scoring below the benchmark. 
in each of the previous three spring assessments for K through two combined. The bottom graph zooms in a bit and shows that breakdown by grade level. So when looking at the percentage of students who did not meet the benchmark, we want to see short bars in that bar graph. The shorter the bar, the fewer the students, fewer students missed the benchmark, which means that the more students met or exceeded the benchmark. So you have to do a little bit of mental geometry here. So if you're looking at the bottom graph, you can see that in spring 2022, the darkest bar, 20.2% of kindergarten students scored below the benchmark, a 4.4% decrease from 21, 28.6% of first grade students scored below the benchmark in the spring of 2022, which is a 17.3% point decrease from 21. Remember, that's a good. And, um, and 30.3% of second grade students scored below the benchmark in spring 2022, a 5.1% point decrease from 21. Remember, in this case, the word decrease is a good thing because it means the decrease in the percentage of students not meeting the benchmark. So you can see the percentage of students identified at risk grew from 2019 to 2021. That's that middle blue color. And by the end of 2022, the percentage of students not meeting the benchmark is coming down again to almost pre-pandemic levels. Second grade this spring um, showed below pre-pandemic levels on their PALS achievement. Below meaning fewer students being identified. So overall at this sort of 30,000 foot view, we see a very promising trajectory from our K2 data. This is another way to look at that same data. The green pie slice represents the percentage of students who exceeded the BLP benchmark by a very healthy margin. The yellow includes students who met the benchmark or exceeded it by only, but by only a few points. So even though they met it, we do monitor and intervene within the classroom to continue their achievement. The red pie slice represents the percentage of students who did not meet the benchmark. So you can see a big jump in students in the red and the yellow ranges from spring 19 to spring 21. And then in spring 22, you can see the number of students in the red and yellow is decreasing, which is what we wanna see, while the percentage of students in the green or the low risk category is growing. Note that there is no spring 20 data because we were closed from March 13th through the end of the school year. So no divisions collected data in that, um, in that assessment window. So again, this tells us that overall, we are moving in the right direction. But I wanna drill down and take a hard look at the literacy health of our different membership groups. So this chart gives us a much more granular view of how the COVID-related disruptions affected different membership groups. In this example, we are looking at three different first grade cohort data in the spring of 19, the spring of 21, and the spring of 22. The students represented by the darkest bar are our current fourth graders right now. That's their data when they were in first grade. The students represented by the middle bar are our current third graders when they were in first grade. And the lightest bar represents our current second graders when they were in first grade last year. So showing this cohort data so you can see how this affected different groups of kids. So you can see that the students most impacted by the COVID disruption are black students, English learners, students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged students and Hispanic students. We know that our gaps were problematic before COVID and we know that these gaps have widened significantly because of COVID. So again, while we are making gains overall, we know that we have even further to go now that our gaps have widened. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna show you our fall VLP, otherwise known as PALS data for our current kindergarten, first and second grade students. Keep in mind that VLP is not a growth measure in the same way that MAP is. So what you are going to see is a snapshot in time of where that group of students were achieving in September and October of this year when they completed the VLP assessment. The data on the following slides are not comparable to these previous 
data because they are showing fall data. This is showing spring data. All right, so we're gonna start with our current second grade cohort. This is where they were when we assessed them this fall. We finished in early September. And here you can see our current second grade cohort. These, um, these students completed kindergarten mostly virtually. So think about that. And if they were in pre-K, they missed part of that year. I should also note that the percentage of English learners not meeting the benchmark in second grade this fall includes a lot of our ESL newcomers, and we would not expect them to be meeting BLP benchmarks if they are new to the country and new to English. But we collect this data because it's an important baseline for those kids, and typically with those students, we see exponential growth in the literacy of those students. So we want to just kind of always be keeping an eye on them. So in this slide, you're seeing the percentage of students who did not meet the fall benchmark in second grade this year. Again, you can see the pattern of who is more impacted in which membership groups. This table shows the percentage of current first graders who met and did not meet the VLP benchmark. You see a similar pattern among membership groups, but this cohort is presenting with more students in each category who are meeting the VLP benchmark. So they are doing better. These students were fully in person last year in kindergarten. And if they attended our preschool, they did so virtually. Finally, this, is our, this, uh, this data shows our current kindergartners by membership group and the percentage of students who met and did not meet the fall VLP kindergarten benchmark. You can see that the pattern of inequitable achievement is already present at the beginning of the year in kindergarten. Teachers and principals have deeply analyzed this data, made instructional and intervention plans, and we know we have a lot of work ahead of us. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears to bigger kids. These are the upper grades and the MAP or measures of academic progress test. And again, while VLP is not a growth measure, MAP is. So the top table shows the number of students who had both fall 21 and fall 22 MAP scores. This is important because we have to have two scores in order to have a growth measure. So we did test more students than the number shown there, but some students may have been missing one of the scores. They could have been new students or they could have been absent for an extended period of time. So we weren't able to assess them on MAP but MAP provides growth scores when students have both of these two scores. As students, one thing I wanna just say about this is as students progress through elementary, middle to high school, that growth trajectory on the reading map naturally slows and does in every single context. That is just the way reading progress goes. It slows down at a certain point. What is important is that students are either meeting or exceeding their growth projections. So on that bottom table, that's showing growth from last fall to this fall. The orange diamonds in that table indicate the growth goal for that group of students. And the blue bar indicates the observed growth. So for example, our current fourth grade, that's that first bar on the left, was projected to make nine points of growth, but they exceeded that and made 12. Therefore, the blue bar is above the orange diamond. That is very good, we'd like to see that. You can also see in grades six and eight that the observed growth was less than the projected growth from last fall to this fall. Remember to consider the grade levels in which these cohorts were either out of school or virtual. For example, our current eighth graders were virtual for most of sixth grade and missed part of fifth grade. Again, teachers and principals have already examined this data to understand their students' growth and the scope of work that lies ahead of them. We also use this data to inform instruction, intervention, intervention and enrichment means, as well as individual student goal setting. While we do see some growth in some areas, we know there is work to do. Lastly, our third graders, we don't have a growth measure on our third graders right now because they do not take the MAP test until the end of second grade. MAP test is a comprehension measure, and since many kids in second grade are still learning to read, it's not going to be all that useful in the beginning of, third, beginning of uh, second grade. 
So this is where our current third graders are on reading map or when we tested them in the beginning of September. Um, so again, this data, along with other foundational skill literacy screening data, helps us plan for instruction and intervention. So the implications and impact of this data are significant. There is some good news here. We are showing signs of rebound in every grade and in every membership group. And I'm confident that had we not already been so intentional about our instruction and materials that we would be seeing less rebound. When we look closer, we see that there is an increase of inequitable learning outcomes for students who are black, English learners, disabled, Hispanic, and economically disadvantaged. We know that our data showed inequities before COVID, and we see these inequities are evident at the beginning of kindergarten when kids first come to us. A key implication is how we can sustain our focus on improving our impact in these crucial early years. So what are we doing differently to address the impact of COVID and our inequities? The first thing is that we've already made the shift from balanced literacy toward evidence-based literacy instruction. Some might call that the science of reading. Um, and so we are using curriculum, instruction, and assessments that are grounded in the science of reading, and we have eliminated those that are not. Along with that, we continue to work very hard to define how we are using our literacy resource across all six elementary schools so that we deliver a cohesive and aligned learning experience. This is work we are still doing. Reading specialists, instructional coaches, and teachers have helped to lead this work to refine our pacing guides, our literacy block structures, how we use our time, every minute counts, and our guidance with using our aligned resources. We have also started, we started offering letters training in the 2021 school year. Letters stands for Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. And we continue to train teachers, coaches, specialists, and some administrators. Um, it, this program teaches teachers the content knowledge they need to know in order to teach evidence-based literacy instruction that is grounded in science-based reading research. To date, we have trained 92 staff members in Letters Volume 1 and 13 staff members in Letters Volume 2. We have 32 more staff members in Letters 1 this year and 10 more in Letters 2. We have also trained three facilitators so that we can support these cohorts locally and within their work. But we know that doing letters, just letters, is not enough. So along with letters, we continue to create and provide other training and professional learning to teachers that is informed by letters, but grounded in our very specific resources. And lastly, to that last point, we are building our capacity within specialists, instructional coaches, and teacher leaders to continue to train and support all of our teachers at elementary to deliver instruction grounded in the science of reading using our aligned resources. I'm not gonna spend much time on this slide, but I just wanted to share some of the testimonial about some of the things that teachers are saying about letters and how it's changed their practice and their student achievement, most importantly. So I had more quotes from others, but I was told I had a slide limit. <laughs> I think I've already gone past it, but anyway. Um, so, so we are still participating with the Virginia Department of Education Dyslexia Advisory through their Office of Special Ed. They fund 10 of our licenses every year, and then the division has funded the rest. This partnership with the VDOE has been very supportive of our work here. Finally, next steps. Um, certainly, they include continuing to do all the things that we are doing differently, as well as a few other things. We need to further refine our vision and expectations for how we are teaching literacy grounded in the science of reading. And that includes connecting literacy with social studies and science. That is part of the science of reading, is building vocabulary and background knowledge. We have already done some initial alignment with those two contents and um, within our core reading resource. Our core reading resource includes content focused units with a lot of nonfiction um, text, but we still have work to do there in terms of deepening those content connections. Another step involves our work that will be mandated by the Virginia Literacy Act that was passed earlier this year. That will reinforce all of the things that we are working on and have been for the last two years. One of the key components of the Virginia Literacy Act is that by, the, by school year 24-25, every K-3 student will be instructed with methods and materials 
grounded in evidence-based literacy practices for core instruction and intervention. Another step for us is to dig into a new data set that we now have, um, which is the newly revised VLP, formerly known as PALS, screener for pre-K. Our three-year-old and four-year-old teachers just finished that. Thank you, especially three-year-old teachers trying to assess three-year-olds is, is mighty work. <laughs> Um, this data should help us pinpoint some of the work that we do in pre-K. In fact, I met with a pre-K team this week to dig into that data and plan for how they can integrate literacy and language into play centers and including some targeted instruction. And lastly, I just want to end with this idea that literacy doesn't happen only with good curriculum and instruction. While they are vital and they are powerful level levers that we have, literacy also needs a healthy ecosystem. And that includes a lot of other levers, just to name a few, attendance, mental health for students and teachers, relationships, culturally responsive practices, family support, stable and safe housing, livable income for families, quality and preventative health care, retention and recruitment of excellent teachers and administrators, and ongoing actionable training and professional development for our staff, just to name a few. While we have much work to do and that we can, we can do in the classroom, this is an everyone problem and outside our school wall, within and outside our school walls. And this is the healthy ecosystem that literacy needs. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. It's always lovely to hear from you. Any questions, board members, Ms. Dooley? Yes, I um, have some questions about what happens after fifth grade in terms of supporting teachers um, when we're well past kind of the established learning to read and now reading to learn what um, training and support are teachers getting to also be reading instructors. That's a great question because our many of our students are still learning to read um, in those grades A couple of the things that we've done. Um, we have um, created some very specific tier two classroom based intervention resources for teachers to pick up and use that can be used within their classroom as a not a pull out but a, I'm your teacher and I'm going to do this extra sub support for you. Um, so specifically we've um, we've created those that align with our program in fifth grade. And then we have our reading specialist at Buford who has worked hard to create some resources for teachers train at Buford and she trained them last week. So to specifically work on fluency because that's one of the big levers at that, at that um, stage. We've also offered a course to our secondary teachers. We've offered it twice. Um, the first time we took it was mostly teachers from CHS actually. Um, and it's a course through, um, Achieve the core student achievement partners. It's called. It's called. Um, uh, oh my gosh, it's it's slipping my mind. But it's um, it's uh, supporting older readers or something like that. Um, and it teaches kind of some some things that teachers can do within a regular English language arts class to pin, to focus on a little bit of phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, and then of course vocabulary and comprehension. So we've done some of that professional development. Last year at the high school, we did some professional development around supporting readers before, during, and after reading um, at both um, Buford and the high school. There has been a bit of a refresh on our AVID work, and um, a lot of those AVID strategies are really supportive across the content areas. So it, the load can't all be on English. It's got to be across content areas in, it, in the middle and um, upper level. Um, and then we continue to have support. We are really lucky. We have reading specialists at Walker, Buford, and the high school. And so they work really closely to look at screening da data, to identify students who need additional support, and to put supports into place for them. Any other questions from you? You're okay? All right. Dr. Kraft? Well, well, I'm really impressed, and I just feel like um, a lot of things, but I do feel like you're very on top of, you know, assessment and then doing what's necessary to um, implement and to improve the results where we're needed. So really appreciate that. And I, um, 
you know, keep thinking of all of the years that we weren't using these, uh, you know, evidence-based approaches. And I don't know, that's just my, my thought that we, you know, it, it just seems like maybe we weren't doing the right thing uh, for a long time, but it seems like maybe we are more on the right track now. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering just with the groups, the, particularly the groups, um, you know, that are consistently lower and our black students, I, I guess our students with disabilities, um, are we, are there any, I mean, are there any um, ideas or thoughts that you have in terms of like the content of, um, of the reading material that, you know, that they have available to them or any other, you know, the one-on-one -on -one tutoring that you feel, you know, if you could have a perfect world and do everything, what, what would you like to see to really work with those groups? Well, first of all, I just, for your first comment, I just, I do want to say, I don't think we were doing everything wrong. I just, I think that we, we were, what, what was true about balanced literacy was it was this attempt to kind of be whole languagey, but also have phonics. And so for some kids, that's going to work fine. Some of our kids, they're going to, they're going to do just fine in spite of that. Um, but there's a large percentage of, of students who rely on and need explicit, systematic, cumulative, and data-driven phonics and foundational skills instruction. Um, and then there are there is a chunk of kids who are going to benefit from it. And then there's like this tiny percentage of kids who don't really need it, but it doesn't harm them. So anyway, um, and then to answer your question, um, I think, I've, I've heard some, some of the out of, out of the box things that I hear about kind of that other divisions are doing, um, none that I've heard of in Virginia, but there is definitely talk about how do we extend the, how do we, how do we extend the school day? How do we extend the school year? How do we give, especially high schoolers, an extra year of school? Um, those are really kind of big things. Um, and then you mentioned tutoring. So there is research on um, high dose versus low dose tutoring. And I, the difference is high dose tutoring is what would be considered, um, it's at least three to four days a week. It is not after school, it is during the school day. It is delivered by a trained teacher and it is one hour a day with groups no larger than three. So that is what, there's been some research on that, it's called high dose tutoring being really effective. That research has been done with, um, for the most part, elementary in math and reading, and then at the high school level for specific math, like you missed a whole year of geometry, for example. Um, so there's, um, they've seen some really good effect sizes from that as opposed to low dose tutoring, which I think is what typically happens. And I would say that our former after school program was an example of a low dose program where it was two, two days a week. At, at one point it was three days a week, less than an hour, groups of six to 10, ideally the classroom teacher, but not always. Um, so, uh, so high dose tutoring apparently does work. It is very expensive and it requires a lot of people power to scale it up. So those are the two out of the box things I've, I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Mr. Morris. I guess I have more of a comment than a question. Um, I just hope that we're using this data to inform our budget decisions, um, especially in terms of like our elementary elementary um, scores to make sure that our kids have that knowledge and information um, ahead of time. Um, I even think about like the presentation that we just had in terms of water and usage and all that stuff and to kind of use an analogy um, in terms of like leakage, right? If we have leakage into our system of kids not being able to read up to a certain level, like you can't just start mopping the floor while you still got a, a leak in your pipes. So, I, I mean, for me personally, I, I hope that we are using this data to, to shore up our, our K through three. Um, I mean, we, we know what the issues are. 
Mr. Bryant. Um, first, thank you so much for um, providing us this information and that we are encouraged that students are beginning to, to move in the right direction. But I just have a question. I was sitting as you were presenting. Um, when our kids come to kindergarten, they are, they're all coming from various, um, I would say, steps degrees of learning. And um, I like this last um, paragraph about the healthy eagle system in terms of getting, uh, because they all come um, at different levels. So when new students come into kindergarten, are we seeing ourselves starting all over again, or is it the same pattern until we get them to where they are making, you see in progress? when you have a new group coming in each year? Are you, are asking, you seeing the same patterns? Are you asking every kindergarten, in the beginning of the year, do we see the yes. same inequities? Mm -hmm. Yes, Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. So that is it's a continuous thing. So my question, how could we, um, because I can remember um, my nephew in fourth grade for an example. And I remember I would have to pick him up from school and um, he had books. And he would say, Uncle James, I have to read a book. And then you're gonna to have to read a book to me and then I have to sign off on it. And this is when he was in fourth grade at Greenbrier. So how do we reach out to families to encourage um, or just to teach the basics, numbers and colors and, and, and the excitement of reading? So, cause we know the inequities are there and they will continue to be there until we all are on one accord. You know. I think you, you mentioned this in this health eagle system, but how do, you, how do we go about doing more outreach in that aspect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's like- To this, level the playing field, it's, it's a difficult- Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Task. There's um, so much that happens in kids' lives before they mm -hmm. even come through our doors. That's really, really critical. Um, so I know, you know some of the things we are doing Every school does family outreach. Um, we have we we do that within the school. The, those staff members do it. We have a family outreach, family engagement coordinator, Bianca Johnson, who helps us a lot with that. Um, she's one person, um, and um, we uh, we have a preschool program, which is in, in, is an intervention for those for those kids. I mean we. We get into the preschool program if we fall into one of those membership categories um, so that we can provide some additional support for you. Um, but I think that's kind of also why I wanted to sort of name all these other um, sort of drivers in the community um, because all of those pieces are really, really important. And I, and I think also, um, I think one of the examples that I want to draw is like today, you know, we're, we're doing school success meetings. And, you know, when we're debriefing as a team, uh, with regards to some of the things that we're seeing in the schools, you know, one of the staff members mentioned today that, you know, one of the things that we're going to have to, um, as Ms. Tatel said, um, Ms. Johnson is only, Bianca Johnson is only one person. And so what we recognize is like the school social worker said today, um, I'm going to do a little bit more of that. A anytime we can interact with parents and we can build capacity with them, you know, we do see um, one of the things that we all notice is that students are at very different places. And when we're doing these, when we're doing these classroom um, observations, and while there may, they may be 15 minutes, just a little snapshot, what we see are teachers and paraprofessionals and other specialists use, utilizing centers and providing tier two and tier three supports within the classroom. Um, but then we also recognize it's the ecosystem that we have to tap into all the resources around us um, so that, you know, you know, the home is not always a print rich environment, but we have to send those books um, and we do those things. So I think we just have to continue um, to continue those efforts. And I think, could we do more around family literacy that would be more meaningful to families? Certainly. Mm -hmm. 
Ms. Bryce Morseberger. Um, uh, yeah, I just, the, um, I guess what stands out to me is that even in the data, when we're looking at the improvement, the improvement is still like there's a gap in the improvement as well. Like when you see the numbers coming down, it's, I guess it's just hard for me to understand that every kid is somewhere different and we're meeting kids where they are, but is there like a common benchmark at some point, like when we're kids are coming in kindergarten, they're all at different levels. Are we equitably using our resources at that point to say, you know, of the 20 kindergartners, these five are gonna need, like, I just understand when we're doing interventions, at what point are we expecting the kids to, to catch up or is it always just like the gap is getting wider and wider? No, that's a great question. One of the things that we are doing differently now is um, in terms of intervention is uh, we are using grade level benchmarks as our goals. So it's not enough for me to get you to here if you're not gonna get to here eventually. So what I'm doing with you, that extra support needs to be thinking about what's that on ramp because I've got to get you to grade. I've got to get you to the point where you can access grade level content. It's not enough for me to say you made progress. I've got to get you to make exponential progress. So one of those, one of the things we are doing differently is using grade level benchmarks, which keeps the urgency and the goal on grade level. I think the other thing is um, it's not just about intervention. I think the big sort of theme of, um, I don't want to say post COVID, but wherever we are right now <laughs> in COVID is um, we are not going to intervention our way out of this. This is also about improving instruction at the tier one level for everybody. And so that means really, really ensuring that we have the best teachers in front of kids and that we continue to train our teachers and retain our teachers and that we have mechanisms and processes in place to do that support and training of teachers. Um, and then the other thing, uh, two other things, when we're talking about um, parents and engaging them, it as a parent, sometimes like um, just my personal experience, you do get like this, this is what your kids are going to be doing this year. And it would be helpful to know when you're like showing the map data, I remember the PALS data when I was asking about it for my child it's like, these are the particular areas. Like, I didn't know, like I'm reading to her every night, but I don't know I should be teaching her to point at the words because that's an important part of the test. So is there any like effort to like use that map data to say, hey, parents, or if you're helping your kid out, these are the specific areas they need assistance with? Yeah, I think that does happen, uh, probably not across the board. Um, if you're a parent, I hear you. Um, we, uh, at every school, every school does family engagement events. And I would say pre-COVID, most of those look like a night. And sometimes we are going back to that too, but I think our teachers have gotten really creative during COVID about how to do that differently. Um, and so during that time, there's often that kind of, kind of parent education around here are some things that you can do. Um, um, I think also, um, it's, it's not always about expecting the parent to be the teacher um, because, you know, we don't want to start saying you've got to do flashcards at home. That's not what we want to say. But it is, it is about sort of supporting, supporting families also with some of those other things that are just how do you get your kid to talk more? How do we elicit language from our three-year-olds at home? Um, some of those kinds of things. Um, so I do think those, those do happen at those school-based um, engagement because we do have um, like parent university. I think that probably has a, um, a, a not expansive enough outreach, um, especially to the families who probably would benefit from it the most. Um, we are starting to engage with a family literacy. Um, it's mostly through uh, adult ed um, that they're going to be doing to support some of our English learner families. Um, so could we be doing more? Absolutely. Yeah. And I understand we, we're not saying to parents, we want you to be the teacher, but if I can't afford outside tutoring and things like that, and I still want to help and support, it just would be helpful, I think, to just say like here, because the people who can afford it are going and getting their children those interventions. 
And then the last thing was, I know that the high dose tutoring is expensive, but like with everything, if we can look into like what a pilot program would look like, even if it's just at one particular school and one particular class for the kids who need, you know, who are the ones in, in those categories where they are slipping further behind, um, just to see like an idea of what it would look like and what it, it would cost to just try it. Yeah, and I think we would have to consider the people power. So it's not just the money, but who's gonna, who are the right people to do that work and, and where are they coming from? Yeah. Ms. McKeever. I just want to say, I do not read to my child every night. As you are well aware, I've been telling you since kindergarten. Um, also he's in that sixth grade cohort. That's very not rebounding as well or under the map not really there yet with the diamond. Um, but, uh, and he just finished his first chapter book. I'm very pleased. <laughs> um, but anyway, I um, really appreciate your uh, take on all of this. I just think it's really important to be incredibly transparent and, and, tr and open about this data. Um, obviously we had a pretty big discussion in sub September. Um, it's just like an ongoing issue, you know, thing that we're constantly wanting to monitor and stay on top of. So we welcome your input as usual and your leadership. I just feel like you have really, um, it's not, I don't know if it's a train analogy, but like riding the train a little bit, um, transitioning from where we have were to where we are and kind of recognizing that we are gonna, we're, we're making, uh, uh, we're growing. And um, I just really appreciate your attitude and your just really directness about it all. Um, so thank you. And, um, you know, I would love to see longitudinal data, right? Like, I think you tried to do that with the COVID um, benchmark rates, K2. I thought it was very helpful, like with the granular approach. Um, I like being able to see how a cohort in kindergarten is doing today in third grade. Um, so that's incredibly helpful to kind of monitor if that's what longitudinal means. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I think if we can continue to see that data, those cohorts, um, I think so often we look at a snapshot of this grade level. And um, I think the one potential, you know, the, with the COVID pandemic and the shutdown really does require us to look more longitudinally. So I, I hope that we will continue to do that. So thanks for that. Thanks. Ms. Bird. Yeah, I have a quick question. So I noticed that in the data presented that it, it only goes through eighth grade. Um, to what degree do these patterns continue at the high school? Because um, I know we continue to take the map test. Um, oh boy, do I know. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, just, I just wonder whether the, the growth is, the growth gaps and the growth is, follows the same pattern to the same degree. That's a great question. And it takes a high schooler to ask, ask that question. So thank you. Um, yes, um, we, we did take it in ninth grade. Um, I, I didn't include the ninth and 10th grade data uh, this time. It just wasn't requested. So, um, but we, we do continue to see the gaps there. I think what happens in high school is there are also other ways to demonstrate, um, uh, to demonstrate mastery so that, um, so that students can compl successfully complete the coursework they need to graduate. Um, but I, I will say, um, I do know that a lot of the teachers at the high school, and this is not just Charlottesville, this is across the nation in high school, is that they are seeing a lot more kids in high school who have really big gaps in their reading because of, because of COVID. And they've always been there, but they're much wider now in high school. And most high school teachers aren't trained to be reading teachers. And so they are doing everything that they can, um, but it is definitely, we are definitely seeing it and it's, and it's impacting science and it's impacting social studies um, because you need to be able to read in those classes. And so I think that, that AVID work and that some of that uh, disciplinary literacy across the content area is gonna be an important thing for us to, to work on. 
Did I answer your question? Yes. So are there, are there specifically literacy related intervention techniques taking place at the high school or is that more? Yes, there are actually. So we have two reading specials. We also have a lot of our ESL teachers are now, um, you know, since we have so many students coming in at middle school and high school who um, they don't, they, they don't know how to read English at all. They don't know how to speak English. They don't know how to read English. So, so they're actually doing some intervention-like things to teach English learners um, how to read in English. Um, but we do have two, um, two reading specials at the high school. And we, we have done a couple of different things. Sometimes they are um, pushing in and supporting kids within a class. And sometimes they are um, working with students in like a small um, like a small class that's, that's an additional class for them. Um, and so we do have that happening this year at the high school. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Good questions. Mr. Morris, do you have some more questions? I'm looking at you over here. Um, I think one of the things I, I think about and it, it might not be completely relevant to this discussion. So that's why I was trying to trying to hold off a little bit, but you mentioned mastery to some degree. And I'm just kind of curious, like how standards-based grading plays into how we look at this data and how we get to the point where we're still, and I think we brought this up a couple of meetings ago, like we're, the achievement gap continues throughout the school year or throughout their school tenure, I should say. Yeah. Um... I'm sorry, did you say standards-based? Yes. Okay, so we are doing that in math, the high school and the middle school, and a little bit at Walker. We have not really dug into it as much in English at the secondary level because it, it's not like a one-to-one. -one. It looks actually very different for English. Where we have started to do some standards-based work is actually at the elementary school around um, both those um, component like component skills with literacy, like there's a standard around knowing your long vowels. And so I can assess that, I can teach that. Um, so we have created for teachers, um, actually it's, a, it's, pre, it's K through five, a standards-based checklist for them to use with the foundational skills and with writing. So that's the other place we've actually started to do some standards-based work in ELA, English language arts, is in writing. And we now have a progression. We have a pre-K through fifth grade standards-based writing progression. And actually, teachers just finished. Um, it's, it's a quick checklist that we ask them to do twice a year. They can use it more often. Um, and then we, and, and so we've just, last year we collected collected implementation data. This year, we are collecting student achievement data. But that's been really helpful for teachers to see what, what should I expect my students to be able to do this year? What was expected of them last year? And where are they going next year? And so um, that's been really, really helpful with co conversations and planning and um, really under, it's, it's that mastery. Like, did you master this particular skill? Are you showing it consistently, independently on your own? And then we've done a little bit of work. We have more to do. Um, so we just need more time. <laughs> but we've done a little bit of work with bringing together, uh, we did bring together a secondary vertical team, all teachers who teach English in grades five, five through 12. We brought that team together at the beginning of the year to look at that progression, to look at the standards-based progression, to start to get on the same page a little bit. And we definitely want to sort of expand that to a pre-K through 12 standards-based progression around writing. Thank you. So I've got a couple questions. Um, was curious just data-wise or the way that, that our groups or our students are grouped, why are Hispanics not considered EL? <laughs> Um, or, I mean, why somebody is that... else can jump in here, but um, because not... Hispanic is considered an ethnicity code, yeah. and EL is um, we when 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 families register their children for school, they fill out a home language survey, and if they say my child is an English learner, uh, a, or ESL in some divisions, um, then they get they get classified as an English learner, and then we do some screeners, some EL screeners, and I think. Dr. Fowles is supposed to be talking later. She can talk more about that. 
but if you, it means different things and you can be um you can be a, and i think the easiest way to you can be um the ethnicity is hispanic you can be born here and be of hispanic descent you can speak english very fluently you're an l student because you have you don't have the language you've gone right. through the you've gone through the screener you're now receiving level one two three four um service i mean it's a clear yeah. distinction that's but, right. it, but it's the language that's the barrier it's the language. that's I driving can, that gap yeah correct? i can be hispanic and speak fluent english and i don't right. need esl services that's correct right Does yeah i'm just curious i mean i mean it's a significant and I will say, and I and I said this before, but I'll, it's a, it wor it's worth repeating that some of that is it's not artificially inflated, but a lot of the kids in that EL group are our level one and two learners, and so their English literacy growth is going to be exponential. Um, so they're not always going to be in that in that bar. But we do what we do is re also really keep an eye on on those kids, but also we don't think about them as all the same kind of kid. So a, a level one is very different than a level four, somebody who's been here for four or five years. Right, and I guess I was referring to just the, the data on the Hispanic mm -hmm. kids was pretty significant. Yes. I mean, I was surprised. Anyway, going back to the map um, data that you provided, I'm just curious, do you guys have any thoughts on, so when we look at the sixth grade cohort and how they didn't even meet, our little diamond. So they were virtual all of fourth grade, correct? And then part of their third grade. Um, but then when you look at the fourth grade cohort, I mean, they, they missed second grade and part of first grade, correct? Am I, yeah. am I thinking that what, mm -hmm. correctly? Um, which is really foundational years as far as the literacy instruction. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on why that sixth grade co cohort who had more of that instruction did so poorly. Well, I think one thing that Ms. Swift spoke to when she presented was that we do see, we have three transitions that students make in this division to fifth grade, to seventh grade, to ninth grade. And so that sixth grade data is actually, because this is the beginning of sixth grade, this data. So it's actually a reflection of that transition they made to fifth grade. And so we do see a dip in the data when kids transition to fifth grade, to seventh grade, into ninth grade. So then what have you and your team and the, and the team at Walker, what are they doing to really focus and change um, instruction there for mm -hmm. those students? So the, specifically the sixth grade team um, has um, done a lot of work around this fluency piece to try to give students that additional fluency practice that they need. Um, the fifth grade team is digging into that as well. Um, we have, they, I know that they rearranged their schedule so that intervention could happen every day, so two days a week. So students who are going to get um, an additional intervention will get that four to five days a week. So that's really important. Um, and um, they are um, continuing to build their, their teams and their processes for planning for high quality instruction. Thank you. Um, I think that's it. I did wanna make just a plug and I, I'm sorry if it's premature, but I, was, I listened to the Buford and Walker PTO meetings last night and um, I believe Bianca Johnson, Ms. Johnson said that she was teaming up with Ms. Swift possibly to do some type of family engagement around um, or explaining to parents what, what MAP represents and, and what that means. And I know I heard both of the principals, um, Dr. Hastings and, and Mr. Jordan talk about that the MAP scores will be going out with with um, report cards here in the next week or so. So it's a great opportunity for parents to, to follow up. And, and I know it, it is a little um, confusing to get that and to not understand how it can be utilized and what it reflects. But I, I do hope, and it sounds like we are um, using that data to really drive our instruction. So was that correct, Ms. Swift? All right. <laughs> and I was just at Buford today with one of the teams and they were um, talking about how they're going to plan. They do a lot of goal setting with students. So they sit down with students and 
talk through their, their data and do some pretty explicit goal setting with them. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I just, as always, appreciate hearing from you. You know, Thanks. literacy is my passion. So thank you for all the work that you're doing throughout the division. And please let us know how we can continue to support. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, we will now have um, a strategic plan update by Amanda Corman. I believe this is her first time presenting since I've been here. So we will have her now. Hello, Dr. Gurley, Madam Chair and the board. Thank you for having me this evening. I am here to update you on our next strategic plan, 2023 to that's not a typo, 2029. This is my first time in front of the school board. You probably have seen that face in your inbox, but here I am. It's good to see you. I'm the community relations liaison. I work with Beth Chuck. So just briefly, a brief moment to look backwards at our strategic planning process uh, from, the, from the past, the plan that we're still currently in, the 2017 to 2023 plan. Uh, this graphic, our focus areas is up in all of our schools and in our division office. I'm sure that uh, people at home have seen it. And this is a plan that was created after an, a lot of meetings, community meetings with parents and students and staff and the community and was rolled out in August of 2017. Um, since the rollout of that plan, the community's priorities have really explicitly shifted towards equity, as I don't think I have to tell this group um, in the 2017 to 23 plan, equity is listed as a core value, but as you can see, it is not a, a key focus area. And of course, the pandemic also altered the course of this plan that we're currently under. So that is all to say that we have a, a really great opportunity when we're talking about the next strategic plan and thinking about what are gonna be our guiding lights as we develop this new plan. And so certainly we will plan to center community voice and I'll talk a little bit more about that next as well as Dr. Gurley's leadership. This will be the first strategic plan with Dr. Gurley as our superintendent. Because so much about the 2017 to 23 plan um, there's, you know, uh, so much of it is remains relevant. We will certainly extract from that as a part of this process of evaluating and building a new plan. And we will also build on the equity framework and dashboard that, um, that have been worked on over the past couple of years. And certainly um, thinking about tracking progress and how we will uh, communicate amongst the division and to, the, to our community about developing qualitative and quantitative ways to track what can be tracked and to tell the story of the plan's progress and the progress of our goals and objectives for the division. And this is just a lovely photo of a Greenbrier student measuring his teacher. So talking a little bit about bringing in community voice and what the strategic planning process will be like. So, in a lot of ways, this the visioning you know has already begun for this. So this is so the 2023 to 29 plan will be ready to go um, for fall of next year, and I'll I'll talk about the timeline timeline in a in a minute. But um, we have some specific plans for things we'd like to do over the over the winter and into the spring before the plan rolls out for the fall. But in a way, all the work that we do in the community and the community engagement that we are doing constantly is helping us you know, get a sense of where the community is at and what its priorities are gonna be. So for instance, we you know, recently completed a survey about the 2024 budget. Um, and we recently closed a survey about Venable and Clark school names. Those are places where the community has told us its values, told us what concerns it has, told us where where, where it wants to see the division go. Answering those specific questions about those um, things that we asked about, but also giving us a, a good pulse. And of course, in addition to that, our regular family and community engagement outreach work, the advisory committees, including Dr. Gurley's uh, staff advisory committee and student groups. Um, and then recently 
the on a professional learning day, our staff participated in some, you know, vision casting to talk about talk about goals for the division. So these are all ways that already we're hearing from staff, hearing from students, hearing from families, and hearing from community members about what they want to see our future as a division to hold. Just a quick glance at the timeline. So we did. Um, we did notify the community in August 2022 as a part of the, our, our annual mailing to communities, our, our calendar and um, information about the school year, notified folks that this is, this is coming up, it's time for a new plan. Um, and currently we are preparing a request for proposals for a strategic plan consultant. So that is the current action item that's going to be going out very soon. The RFP is going to be uh, going live very soon. And we hope to have a consultant selected by December so that we can hit the ground running in 2023 with community engagement. Um, and we'll create a draft plan and then we will bring that again to you uh, in May of 2023 for a discussion and hopefully for a vote in June and then in August to be able to really roll it out, um, kick it off and make sure that the community stays uh, informed about what our goals are and how we're doing over the next five years. And so, as I said, that RFP will be posted on our website or anyone who's looking for that can reach out directly to me as well and stay tuned for community engagement opportunities coming up soon enough. And that's it. I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions, anybody? All right, Dr. Kraft. Yeah, I'm just curious about um, why why are we hiring an outside consultant to yeah. uh, lead this process? Yeah, great great question. That I think that the best way to think about it is that we've got the division has experienced so much change, uh, so much change over the course of the previous strategic plan that we thought that it would be, um, in addition just to the significant amount of legwork that's gonna go into um, taking on, you know, taking on the management of the, of the community, the, the broad community feedback that we wanna do and then distilling that, combining it with all the stakeholder feedback, in addition to the fact that it's just a, a significant lift, we thought that having an additional outside voice to help us, um, to help mm -hmm. us make sure that we're, you know, dreaming big. Um, on this and getting our goals, getting our goals aligned um, across the division. That was the, that was the motivating. Okay. Yeah, I guess I, you know, I was just thinking that, um, um, you know, we, we are talking so much about um, issues in the community and, you know, want to make sure that, um, that this process really um, incorporates a familiarity with this community and some of the issues that we've had and some of the needs that we've had and that, you know, an outside person from somewhere else um, doesn't bring that knowledge. The way, the way that I see it is that the outside person is a, is a thinking partner to help us figure out what we think, not to tell okay. us what okay. they think. Good. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thanks all. We will um, now have a transportation update by um, Ms. Kim Powell. Hello again, Madam Chair, members of the board and Dr. Gurley. Um, it's been a pretty good day for transportation. Um, we still have a lot of work to do, but I'm happy to report that our new route set did go out, that messaging has been released. How do I know that? My inbox. But the inbox is actually looking pretty good um, so far. A lot of just thank you messages, which was great. Um, the new routes do start next Wednesday, November 9th, when the students return. It is like starting school over from a transportation standpoint. That's the lift that's been underway. And there will be another lift just like it, hopefully around January timeframe, depending on how the next cohort of trainees, driver trainees, uh, how that goes. 
but the message did go out and our weight lift lists are very dynamic. Um, I will say the new route set has reduced the weight lift list by over a third, right around 35%. Back in September, I projected it would be more than that, but because of our continued growth in students, some of what you'll hear about from Ms. Fouts later on the agenda, there are more students that have also been added on as we have taken students off the wait list. Because by no means is this new release of routes the only work we do, we literally evaluate and bus manifest, and we have a weekly process now of trying to maximize the available bus capacity. Um, it's, it's a whole new world with how we handle these things now um, in an effort to maximize our available resources. The current driver outlook, because the number of drivers we have ultimately drive our ability to provide bus service. We you know, still, as of this moment, have the eight regular drivers plus two leads for 10 total, one cat driver helping four uh, drivers in, in process and one is actually completed, two are doing like behind the wheel and there's a third, the fourth one is um, doing a, a round of testing at DMV tomorrow. So we're still working through that cohort, but it's going well. Um, we do have one CCS staff person who has completed the independent pilot of that online training. And so our next move will be with Mr. Andy Jones and the coaches and so forth who uh, our own staff who uh, want to do that, you know, independent training for the classroom portion, and then they'll do the behind the wheel, and then that will give us additional capacity for field trips and other activities, athletics, and so forth. We're really excited about that, and we do have three new applicants, so that's really good. Um, our keys moving forward is are just continuing the driver recruiting and training efforts. Uh, we have to continue to monitor um, our competitive compensation situation. And it's not just all about the money, but the supports and the working conditions at CAT to help make sure we maintain the drivers, you know, maintain, retain, support the drivers we have. Um, Julia took some goodie bags to them from us. Um, was it this week or last week? It's all a blur, but just little things trying to show our appreciation. And we'll do another thing in the spring. Um, we need to maintain our crossing guard team and our school staff walking groups. Again, transportation for us now is a whole lot more than just about the big yellow bus. So that crossing guard army that we have recruited, we need to also uh, maintain and support those folks as well. Um, and then we need to continue identification and support for pedestrian and infrastructure improvements. Um, the city has made a great move to hire a, and I'm going to mess up the title, but he was on, he joined our um, Safe Routes weekly meeting today. So we have the traffic engineer and I believe his title is traffic planner. Um, his name is Ben, but anyway, he was great, a great add to our team today. And we're super excited about working with him and some of the things that the city is doing to holistically look at traffic and transportation um, for the city, things that will benefit not only our students, but really the whole community. So there's a lot of strong work happening there. Um, I see momentum. And I think the schools were a big part of that. And uh, we, we need to continue to evaluate our pupil transportation system and our driver needs in the context of how many drivers do we really need given our new family, um, you know, responsibility and walk zones. What, uh, what do we need to do to be most cost effective with our contract services uh, for special transportations? Um, those are things like not just our special needs students, but also McKinney-Vento, if you're familiar with the uh, federal laws for uh, requiring transportation for homeless students. And then we are continuing to look at options to use smaller buses that don't require the CDL. We have two on order, but we, you know, those are not small investments. So we wanna to continue to be strategic about those and look at how that type of bus can help solve our, our needs. So um, that's all I have for you this evening. Happy to take questions. Questions, anybody, comments? Ms. Vashundra. I was just wondering how many students are, are remaining on the, the wait list when it went down? What's um, about 740 at this point. There were up until we did the new routes it had gotten up to 1,000, over 1,120 students. And we got it back down to like 740. Again, not the progress we had hoped for, but there were so many students who have continued to add in. Um, and also students who start off as lower priority they tend to migrate up to medium and high and then new students join in. And so it's just, um, it's, there's, there's still more demand out there than we are able to satisfy. But I will say that the response to this round of routes 
has been so far very positive, um, and which has not always been the case, like with the early routes. Um, we, the just gauging from email, not to say the needs aren't still out there, and we still the work has to continue until there is no wait list for those students who are eligible. And then for the um, the walking, I've noticed it seems like everything's going good. But will there be um, will there be like a push as the daylight savings time and the you know like the are we going to change up some of our you know push or messaging the families and how we're doing the routes. So I'm not sure if I totally understand the question. I, I can tell you that one of the things we ordered with our supplies early mm -hmm. on were flashlights so that any student who feels like they're starting to walk, you know, when it's still a little darker outside. And, and um, we also have done reflective tape, which the schools have stocked to like put on backpacks and jackets if students want, you know, if, if there's a, a need identified for that. Because even back in August, when we started ordering our supplies, we realized that you know, for some of our students, they may be walking earlier. Now, granted, that's our elementary students who shouldn't be walking alone anyway, and we are providing the walking school bus support for those large groups. I have a question, um, just as we're heading into winter months and what kind of conversations are taking place with the city in terms of shoveling sidewalks um, and enforcement with property owners of making sure that sidewalks are cleared. I just fear that we're going to have a lot more snow days this year because of sidewalks. Sorry, Dr. Gurley, your eyes got real big. Um, but knowing that, you know, before we just needed roads and bus stops to be cleared, but now we've got so many more kids walking. So, so what's the plan? Yes, we've been having very intentional conversations about that. It was actually a, a significant topic on our um, call today because we're working with the city for, to identify the households that are on our key corridors for walking to school to make sure that those messages go out about the importance of the snow removal within the 24 hours and all that. And we actually today talked about it in the context of it came up around the leaves. And they, they, the city asked us, are you having people complain about you know, kids trying to walk and having all these leaves piled up on the sidewalks? Because you're seeing the city trucks now starting to go around and get them. They're supposed to not be on the sidewalk. They're supposed to be on the curb. Um, but the city was asking. They wanted to make sure that we didn't have anyone reporting issues with that. And um, we actually started a conversation about once we have that list of addresses, not just sending out the messaging for the snow removal, which, which should be going out soon. In fact, Amanda's been working with us on that. Thumbs up, yep. Um, so we're collaborating around that messaging. But we talked about how it's snow, it's potentially leaves in the fall, it's potentially mulch in the spring when people get mulch. You know, you might find people who have mulch piled up on the sidewalk temporarily. And so just making sure people are keenly aware that you live on a route that is where a lot of kid, kids are walking. And so we need to keep those sidewalks clear. And the cities are the people, they are the folks who are giving us those addresses to help with those communications. Along those lines, what about um, kids who need boots? Snow Again, boots. family engagement team. Are we, are we able to do that for them? Yeah, coats and boots have always been kind of at the core of what we coats, do in the schools, not just in well the closed with. closets, but also in the uh, schools. And we also invested in the um, shoe booty, like booty protectors, these things you can put over your shoes to help make sure they don't get wet. They're not necessarily multi-use, but we definitely can supply yeah. those to schools. Um, and we stock all those things through the, fam uh, through the FACE team, the family engagement. And one of our, and during our school visit today, uh, one of the walk and bus leaders, uh, she mentioned that on the cold day, she did take um, gloves and hats to um, so when she went out to go get the students. So they are, uh, they are using those resources. And she mentioned that I think they're up to 30 students in their walking group. Um, so she said that they've been consistently um, coming. So excited about that. Mr. Morris. Um, for the type A buses, we were thinking April. You got a quick update. Are we still thinking April supply chain? <laughs> or what are we thinking? Not sure that what happens is they'll hold that date and I, we wouldn't get another date until closer to February or March based on, I mean, they're, they're still going to say um, April, but um, we are still seeing the impacts of supply chain in a, in a lot of areas. Um, our security work with access control still has really long lead times for the boards, for the um, controllers. And those are the same types of components that go into the electrical parts of the buses. So. 
Mr. Bryant? No, I have a question. Just glad to know that we're staying on top of it and we're uh, constantly getting new applicants. Again, I wait this. Mr. Ms. McKeever. Okay, Ms. Bird. Um, kind of along the lines of the the snow and the and the sidewalks, and I don't know how much control the city has over who they contract with when they're plowing the roads. Um, but sometimes I don't I don't know if they can review um, where they plow that snow to because sometimes it ends up on corners where bus stops pick up kids and then when it melts and refreezes it, it's so hazardous. So we, we did that topic came up this past year and one thing I learned is the city had a lot of because of turnover they had a lot of new people city employees pushing last year. Hopefully that won't be the case this year but we certainly. Um, We've had that, you know, that was identified as an issue last year. It has been discussed. And at the time, it was felt that that was certainly one of the issues. And they pull, a lot, I mean, they pull people from everywhere. You, like the way we handle the start of school and you see all of us out there doing our thing, the city responds to snow events in much the same way, but they have had a lot of turnover. And so um, they just, uh, when we would bring up different problem spots, that's what we learned was happening. So hopefully they haven't had, hopefully a lot of those people here who were with the city last year pushing are still there now. I, I don't know for sure, but. Yeah, I mean, I think the turnover is understandable, but if they can prioritize the messaging to their yes. current employees, you know, I think when there it comes was a lot to, of lessons learned to last safety, year. that would be great. Yeah. Um, and then along the lines of just safety, a reminder to, you know, all parents, wherever you're picking kids up or if kids are walking or and as these routes change, um, and, and hopefully our principals, if, if they're tuning in or, or if we can remind principals to put messaging out to families, to slow down, you know, and to, to be kind and to be patient. This could be your child that runs out in front of a car, God forbid, um, you know, or an adult who's, you know, running across to get somebody. So it really is, it, you know, as Ms. Tatel's message put out the ecosystem, it takes all of us as a community to take care of each other. Um, and so just a reminder, if we can push that out with messaging as well. And I think a reminder, as we continue to look at these new routes, a reminder to everybody that it is like this. I remember when we did this last year, you know, and parents were calling in and the buses weren't showing up. Well, it's because the routes had changed and new, new riders were being picked up and things like that. So every family got a message that said, even if you had a bus assignment, it said, you know, please note, make make sure you're the bus color, the bus stop. And I um, special thanks to Beth Chuck, who's become a real, she's a whiz at a lot of things, but getting these mass messages out and they're all customized, it's it's something working with Pat and his team. So, but that um, seems to have gone pretty well for today. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We also have Kim Powell for a safety update. Thank you, Dr. Gurley. Actually, um, Ms. Torres's comments were kind of a lot about safety, so it was appropriate backdrop for your closing comments on transportation. Um, at the last board meeting, there were a number of um, comments or questions from staff and, and community, and so we wanted to address those with, with um, some slides here and also talk about things we did specifically in the month of October. So we do have annual drill minimums. Actual incidents may replace drills, and here you see them. Evacuation is one category of drills, and we have 12 of those. They're typically called fire drills. Shelter in place is another category of drills. These are the state categories. We have one tornado drill and one earthquake drill. And then lockdown is the third state category of drills, and we have four of those. We have our crisis management plans and our school crisis management teams which Mr. Jason Lee is doing a lot to um, help mobilize those teams this year um, in all transparency during COVID. It was just a different type of crisis and we didn't have the CMTs meeting as regularly. And now with um, where we are, we are certainly making sure that the CMTs are all up and running. Um, our safety audits and trainings are pretty extensive. This year, um, we had a summer safety seminar that Mr. Lee put together for all 12 month employees, admin and, and office staff. We had an online Canvas course that was pushed out to all employees going over our safety protocols and for everyone. Um, we have our staff meetings and 
between now and the first part of December, actually within this month, every school will do a review of our three key incident um, protocol responses as part of their staff meeting. We pushed out a two-page summary, and we actually also pushed out scripts if they want to do more in-depth drills with their um, school teams, their school community. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we did that at CHS on the PL day, how all of this worked out. Again, I mentioned crisis management teams, they have their meetings, and then we do have an annual DCJS audit that's required, and we use the standard format, the standard questions and so forth for that, but we also do CCS specific audits. This is something we did pre-pandemic, we're doing it again now with a door survey. Pre-pandemic, we did things like we would have someone go around with a checklist for each school and talk to staff. Do you know what your primary and secondary evacuations routes are? Have you drilled on your primary and secondary evacuation routes? Have you discussed drills from common areas as a team? Because we know that's something that's really hard to do. No one schedules a fire drill for lunch. It is so disruptive, but you need to talk about it. You need to be aware. We talked about visitor protocols. These were things that were in some of our, we would take in any given year. Um, and we did two rounds of these with me in this position before the pandemic we would decide like what we felt like needed to be addressed or what we were hearing about and we would customize the audits based on that. Again, right now we're focusing on doors and door operation. And that, that, that is something that we um, started on in October. Um, we did have four hoax slash accidental E911 calls within a 30 day period between September 19th and October 30th. There were two for CHS plus and the dates are given there, but there was also that web, that first rumor of a weapon weapon search incident as well on 9-1, so it was a lot. And then there were two of these hoax or accidental E-911 calls for Buford, um, 9-20 and 10-20. So that, that's just been a lot for our school community. And, and so with that, there have been a lot of concerns. And so during October, this is a list of the specific actions and activities that we did in response to helping the staff and our school communities move on from those incidents. So we did do external door inspections. Those were completed for CHS and Walker. Um, and we also checked with all CHS staff members to make sure they had the keys they need. And in that process, only two additional keys were issued, but we did leave the CHS admin team. We, we made sure they had, there was a stock of additional keys if they need them so that there's no delay if someone needs a key, um, a teacher or sub, whatever. Um, Next up, we will continue our external door inspections with city facilities because those are most impactful when you're inspecting the doors with the right people on the team, meaning the city's door hardware expert um, with uh, Julia Goes representing my office and then Steve Vineyard from our tech team because there's a mechanical component to the door operation. There's an electrical component with access control often and then Julia and I are just keeping track of it all and making sure it gets, gets taken care of. Um, we did move forward with purchasing um, these red phones because of the issue with um, when those calls would go into E911 without having an officer in the building, there was no way for, um, for the E911 and therefore for law enforcement to know what was the legitimacy of, the, of what was being called in. So we have these red phones. We're um, going to roll them out next week. We have a plan for how we're going to test and audit them periodically so they just don't just sit there forever and be forgotten. And I will say that you have to understand when the new safety model was put in place, we worked with the principals, particularly um, Dr. Irizarry here at CHS at the time, we scripted all these different scenarios and how we would handle them. Not once did any of us think about a hoax E911 calls. It just wasn't something that we had contemplated, we, you know, and even weapons search, we had a protocol for that, but it ended up the way it comes through the E911 center, it just looked very different than the way it was ever handled where an SRO was in the building. So we've had to learn some difficult lessons about and, and managing how the coordination happens between first responders who are coming in from the outside without having anyone already on the inside, but we're figuring it out. Um, uh, and there's just been a lot of effort around it. All of the blind installations that had been put in um, through the summer and then during the back to school period, they were all completed. We actually ended up, instead of waiting for PL days, the staff at CHS wanted it done more quickly. So we just turned that facilities maintenance loose to just schedule it, even though you know staff and students were in the building, they, the staff wanted us to proceed. We got that message loud and clear and not wait for the PL days. Um, I wanted to put up here, I put up here that all blind installations are complete, but sure enough, we've had a couple of new requests for blinds. So um, it's a continuous process. 
we did release additional train safety training and materials. CHS, the entire staff, um, the community here, custodians, everyone, it was great to see on October 27th. We spent the first part of the day, instead of them doing virtual PL as planned, they, they came in. We did protocol review and drills for the first part of the session. And during the drills, um, Mr. Pitt got on the intercom and he read out you know, the, the drill protocol. And then Chief Durrett was with us. And Chief Durrett, during the lockdown portion, he got on the intercom and he described, you know, this is what you'll see. And uh, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from staff regarding how all of that was done. And then following that, and I think this was just as important and perhaps even more impactful, um, Denise Johnson and Jody Murphy led some climate and culture work, including um, a relationship map mapping exercise with all the names of the CHS students um, and having the teachers and groups and, and the feedback from that um, was really tremendous. So I think, again, that takes us back to the fact that climate and culture really is foundational to the safety model that we're using here. And I think that the data from people like Dewey Cornell indicate that is really, it needs to be the foundation. And so that was, um, we got a lot of positive feedback from the work that was done on October 27th. Um, we've rolled out some of those same materials to the other schools and we're working with them to see how and if they want to do it. But here at CHS and potentially at Buford, because of all the swatting or whatever you want to call it, there was just, uh, there was a feeling and a need and a request that we do more to talk about safety. And so that has been done. Um, so similar to how the energy performance people said, you know, it's operations, it's technology and it's people. When it comes to safety, it's facilities and equipment, it's practices and procedures, and it's the climate and climate is foundational. And it is a continuous process. And really part of owning our safety is having a mindset that around safety, it's gonna be a cultural culture of continuous improvement. And hopefully, I think we're all embracing that and moving forward. I'm happy to take questions. Oh, there's one more thing. We do have um, information we're putting together that needs one more round of review. It's, I think the division review is complete, but it's um, information for staff, particularly at CHS and perhaps at Buford if they'd like it, to share with students to go over safety protocols, most likely in English class. But we, we're, that is the, where I think it is. I think we're done with it at the division level, but we wanted to get actually the English department to take a look at it. And so we need to push that to the schools and see when they're ready to have those discussions with students because we also did hear that feedback. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to start down there. I know that we've heard this a little bit, but I thought I'd give Ms. Bird a chance to. Yeah, I have a couple of comments rather than questions. Um, first of all, I'm certainly encouraged by the changes that have been made in October. And though slightly disappointed that these changes only came after traumatizing events. Um, and I encourage us to take more, more action, just be more proactive so that we're not doing things in response, but doing things so that in a more prevent, I know it's all preventative measures, but before something horrible happens. Um, and I, I've seen these, these changes implemented and I have a teacher who got a key that she needed and like mm -hmm. that kind of thing is very encouraging. Um, and I'm very glad that the communication with the students is going to occur. And I think that that can always be improved no like it's there's no perfect like sorry uh, we can continue to do that more and more um and i just encourage us to continue on the trajectory that we are in terms of improving safety like not just again back to the response uh to what happened in the last 60 days um but continuing not just letting it fizzle after in the next month, but continuing on that path. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. McKeever, any questions on this side? Dr. Kraft? <laughs> I just wanted to bring up, um, maybe, maybe this is some of what you're thinking about too, Allison, but um, the issue of fighting in school fighting, you know, as opposed to like an outside intruder coming in. And um, are, are, is the training including uh, what to do in those situations? Um, I, you know, cause I've heard a lot about the recent incident here 
um, at the high school. And I think it's a really tough situation and tough for students, particularly if they see certain people fighting, you know, and the impulse is to jump in in, in one way. So um, I actually had to go to another meeting, so I wasn't there for this part, but I'll speak to what I saw in the materials. And Dr. Gurley, you may have heard been there more firsthand, but basically what I saw in the materials is there was a, a really good review. It started with this idea that every student is your student, not just the students you teach. And then don't ever just walk by a problem. If you see something happening, say something. And there was like a review of how to, how to talk to kids, how to walk up to kids you don't know and actually just, you know, be in their space and be comfortable with that because we felt like from some of the feedback we'd received that some of the staff maybe just wasn't really comfortable with that. They were pretty comfortable with the students they knew from their classroom, but weren't necessarily interacting with all the other students who were in the building. Um, so there was, there was discussion about that and I wasn't there for that part. Then the last part was talking about, it gave guidance like about how to, reminders about how to actually interact with students in that way. Things like how you speak up and how you just kind of get in there, get in the space with them and interact. Dr. Gurley, would you like to add? No, I think you you pretty much summarized it. I mean, we used the second half of the training just to really um, hone in on the relational pieces and getting to know students and, and just how to um, be proactive and quell these disturbances to prevent them from happening. Um, and that, I just think to add to, additionally, to add to the conversation is that um, we really have to um, leverage our community. Uh, we have some very um, influential people within our community. Um, and we also have some people who um, we've not been leaning into. And I, I just think that right now, from what I have observed, um, we just need, we need more people to take um, accountability of what's happening. Like, you know, we have to own a large chunk of what's happening here. Um, but what we also know is that every single, um, almost every single um, disturbance that we've had in the school has been related to something that's happened outside of the school. Um, and so we, we do, we have, to, we have to leverage that. I mean, I, I have parents who are calling me and they're asking me to, you know, help to settle um, these disputes. Um, and I'm willing to always do that. Um, but the thing is there, many of these students are going back into the community and they're two doors down um, from the same person that they have an issue with. And so we do have to um, be more proactive and, and just how we respond to these um, situations. And they did talk about like, if an incident is occurring, these are all the different roles. And the fact is, depending on what's happening, if it's a physical altercation, people has di have different levels of comfort for how they can insert themselves, right? But it, the, the materials that I saw, and again, I had to be in another meeting at this time, but it was like, um, use your voice, help, help clear the halls. If you are comfortable, use your MANT training to help restrain students. It kind of took people through a little hierarchy of if something like that is happening, what role can you take to be helpful, as helpful as you can be in the situation? But um, so that was another component of it, of it. But certainly, both at CHS and at Buford, what we see so often are the these things that are happening. It's not it's hap it's things that have started out in the community, and then it just won't sometimes manifest itself in the school. Ms. Dooley, any questions? Mr. Morse, comments. Um, was just curious, I know you mentioned it, and I know we did this uh, specific follow-up and training with the CHS folks. Have we had an opportunity yet? I know it was planned for the Buford. So Buford is doing the way the print, we, when we sent out the additional materials and their updated flip, uh, flip charts are all going to come in this month as well, probably by next week. Um, we gave the principals the material to go over with their staff. And then a couple of the schools, at least one, maybe two or three, um, they've asked for, like we've said, if you want an additional training like what we did here, if it's not enough for your team just to go over the materials and you're delivering that information to them, then Jason Lee, Jody Murphy, Denise Johnson, myself, whoever uh, will make the time to come and be part of a subsequent meeting or training at their convenience. If they wanna arrange a Zoom or an in-person, um, a few schools have reached out and said our, our school would like an, a little bit more discussion and it's mainly around run, hide, fight. 
which we really put a lot of effort, we clarified how run, hide, fight works in the context of lockdown. And we gave everyone the language to talk about it, but um, I believe even for the conversation that went on here as um, at the point where I had to leave, that was the part that people still, they're just, it's a hard thing to, to process. And those of you who've been through the training, I mean, it's unfortunate that as a society that we have to have that situational awareness skill set. Um, but we really do view it as more of a life skill that we're sharing with all of our staff, not because it's any more applicable to a school than it is anywhere else, as we have seen grocery stores, entertainment venues, regular office buildings. But for some people, it's still just a hard conversation to have. And for principals who want more support or need more support or staff who need more support, we're here to provide that until it's as clear as it can be what the expectations are for everyone. And so everyone has a uniform set of expectations. Unfortunately, there's no uniformity in how any of these situations play out as we've learned from everything that's happened so far this year and we'll continue to learn. This year's no different. Everything is, is, is unique in its own way. Thank you. I mean, I know that we heard um, at Buford, I believe last week that there were some people, some people had took more responsibility just based on what their role is and position in the school. So felt like that there were, you know, there were some definite needs. Um, we'll continue follow, following up. It really does need to be a continuous process. And, and to um, his first point, I mean, we, we certainly, I think what happens is there are people whose safety is a big part of their job. It's a line item in their job description and we're working on it all the time. And then when you take the norm and the day-to-day, -day, that's what people want to focus on. That's what, we want our, that's what we want our teachers and our students to focus on is learning. But safety is really foundational and everyone needs to get to a certain comfort level with, with our safety practices and procedures and invest in getting to that comfort level. Um, and the incidents that happened over 30 days that were um, hoaxes, whatever you wanna call them, it just, um, it's directed a focus in this area that we need, to, we need to get everyone to that level of comfort with knowing what to do. And then we need to make the effort to, make, to maintain it because like anything else, if you completely let it fall off your radar, you forget things or whatever, then you may feel unprepared if something else happens. And I know that um, you guys offered the online Canvas course for employees and that's an annual thing, correct? It is now, that's something new, just like the summer safety seminar. From the division perspective, we pushed out more this past summer than we ever have before. We have a lot of new administrators. And again, we're just, we're all learning together through this new safety model. That piece is without having an officer in the building, there's a lot, we knew communications were gonna be a concern. We, we put that in presentations before, but it's hard to identify exactly how that all plays out into, until, you, until you've experienced it and you've seen everything that can go wrong, it's hard to know what you need to correct in, in something that's new. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you all had thought or had put any thought into, I mean, not necessarily the level of training that you did last week for staff, depending on the number of new employees and for people who hadn't been through that type of training or hadn't taught before to really go through that. I mean, to watch, I watched the video, um, you know, but anybody can turn a video on and be distracted and do something else and, and, but this obviously, this took it to a whole different level, you know, so whether or not there's consideration, obviously it's up to you all to incorporate that into your annual training at the beginning of the school year or something like that. And one of the things that I think one immediate takeaway and, and Ms. Powell sent the communication out for this is that you, I think the level of what we did, I think would probably be difficult to replicate with the number of staff, because we did spread a lot of people thin, but one of the things that we can do immediately, she sent the script out um, that Mr. Pitt read over the um, intercom, telling them that when this, when we call stay put, stay tuned, this is what you would expect, this is what's happening. And so that script has gone out to the staff members and that can be replicated, um, that, that part can be replicated. The afternoon piece is the relational piece. And that most certainly is a train the trainer um, where I think we have to, as administrators, whether it be the principal or director or whomever, we should always be having conversations about relationships with children that when we're walking into buildings, 
whether you're a central office administrator, where you, whether you're the principal, the teacher in the building, that we should be speaking to students and getting to know students when we're walking in the building. So I think all of it is, we can replicate all of it. I, I think it, and we've already, uh, Ms. Powell's already sent out the script that was used um, and asked them to share that with their, um, their teachers and provide the date that that will be shared. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you. All right, um, last on our um, items for discussion, we have Dr. Jeannie Fouts with our um, English language learner update. Good evening, everyone. Um, Madam Chair, school board members, Dr. Gurley, Dr. Odie, um, and all of our guests. Is that a little better? Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me to share information about our ESL program at Charlottesville City Schools. Um, I am going to start out talking a little bit big picture, and I'll, I think it might be easier because with the ESL program, it, I jump around to a lot of different topics. So if you want, if you have questions during some of the slides, feel free to ask them. Okay. So first, we're going to go very big picture. Um, so uh, in Charlottesville City Schools, we have students who speak over 39 different languages. And I put our five most common there. It's Spanish, uh, Dari, Pashto, Arabic, and Swahili in that order. We also have our students um, come from over 40 different countries. Um, and I've listed the five most common there. Um, and then an, an important thing to remember is that many of our English language learners might be born in the United States, but they grow up in multilingual families. And so they might start out speaking one language. And then when they come to school, they learn English as their second language. Um, and so that's why you'll see the United States is um, listed there as where some of our students are born. Um, this next slide goes into our English language proficiency data. The students take an exam yearly. It's called the ACCESS exam, and it's in the spring, and all students in our English language program take it. And um, this is how the, the state measures our um, progress. And so if you look here, um, you'll see the darker blue on the third. That's the VDOE progress target. That's where they want us to be. Um, and then you can see... We, I pulled our 2018-19 data and then through currently. And you'll notice just like in the presentation that Steph gave earlier that um, previous to COVID, we were um, very high. We had 59% of our students meeting um, their progress. The state's goal was 48%. Um, and we had 12% of our students um, exiting the program. Um, during the COVID year, we didn't have any data. And then when we came back from COVID, we had a pretty big drop where 38% of our students were um, making the progress that the state was, was hoping for. And then um, we've had a little bit of a bump. We've gone up to 44% with last year's. Um, I do wanna say a, a few things about that, that if you think about um, online learning and when our students were at home, our students were at home and they're with, they're with their families and they're in this rich language environment, which is not how we assess them, right? And so I think it's important for us to recognize that there might have been benefits for our students' language and literacy in their first language that we can't capture in this data, um, but that also, if we're if we're monitoring English language progress, um, that we saw we saw that dip. Um, it's gone up a little bit, and I think it will continue to go up. But again, our students were not in a school for seven hours a day like they are this year, hearing English um, in all of their classes, and so that. That dip makes sense, uh, but I just wanted to sort of point that out. Um, any questions about the video we data? Enrollment changes. Um, so here you'll see our enrollment changes. This is from 2020. We do two times during the year where we report to the state in the fall and in the spring. And so you'll see from 2020, we just did our fall reporting in 2022. And I need to apologize for my poor data vis visualization because I need that bar to be shorter, right? So we, September 30th, 2022, we had 619 English language learners. As of October 26, we had 649. As of today, it's higher. And so I want to, um, even though we're, we're checking twice a year, as we're checking weekly, our numbers continue to increase. And I think you heard that from the transportation um, perspective as well.
So when we look at our ESL staffing changes, um, that has not kept up with our student enrollment. And so at, in the spring of 2022, based on our projected enrollment numbers, we, I requested um, and was granted two more full-time ESL teachers. So we went from 17 to 19. Um, and Charlottesville City Schools historically has tried to keep a 30 to one student to teacher ratio with our multilingual learners and our ESL teachers. Um, that's really important for several reasons, um, including language support, um, scheduling within a building, supporting both language and content, foundational literacy skills, and lots of other reasons. Um, but even though we've enrolled over 200 more students, we've only been able to increase our staffing right now too. Is there a federal funding or fun, like with these students, are, is there funding attached to them that allows for ELL progress? There is federal funding attached that does not allow for um, FTEs. It doesn't allow for, for staffing for language development because that's a requirement by the federal government. Um, we can use that money for other things. So we can bring in ESL tutors that's above and beyond. We can, um, we can supplement, but we can't supplant what we as a local division are required to do. Yeah. What are surrounding school divisions over here? Sorry. Um, as far you said, 30 to one ratio. 30 to one is what we try. The state requires a 50 to one ratio. Really? But I would not, I can ask, um, I don't think any school system does that well. Most school systems try to drop much lower than that in order to serve the students because we're required by the state to serve every single student in our program in a systemic way. And so that might be in small group instruction, it might be in push in instruction. But if you have one teacher and 30 students in a school, in an elementary school, and we know we have all of the different structures within an elementary, it's really difficult to do that, even, even one to 30, but I would say nearly impossible, one to 50. Is it, do we use ratios for any other groups? Um, yeah, so what is the special ed education ratio? But it's not, I think it's, it's not, it is, but it isn't comparable because I think if you think about the needs of a level one student, um, which requires more supports, may be similar to a student who needs some um, supports in a self-contained um, setting because it's more restrictive, but I don't think it's the same. It's not the same continuum. Um, there has been legislation um, at the state level to try to recognize that, right, the one to 50 for all language learners, which is newcomers who walk in the door who are just learning language all the way up, we say level fours, there's four levels in the access test that they're still within our program. So there is, has been legislation for the last couple of years to try to have the state have more specific guidelines. So if you have level one, which our school usually, because we have a refugee resettlement center, we usually have a heavier newcomer population than our threes and fours. So that is legislation that you'll probably see come up again this year, but it hasn't ever made it anywhere. Do you have um, access to information on trends? I know that there have been international events mm -hmm. that led yeah. to an increase in um, English, language, English language learners in our schools. Do we anticipate this same kind of growth mm -hmm. continuing? Sure, so we, get, we work closely with the International Rescue Committee, which is the resettlement agency in Charlottesville, and they give us an estimation. I can't tell you exactly off the top of my head, but their estimation I think was around they actually went 130%, I think, over their estimation for the last fiscal year. And their fiscal year just ended October 1. Um, and that was because of um, Afghanistan falling. So we saw, whereas typically the, um, the IRC gets families, you know, a couple of families throughout the entire year from different places. Um, we mainly have been getting families from the Congo, families from Syria, um, and families from Afghanistan. We've had families from Afghanistan for years because of the fall of Afghanistan in August of last year, we, they brought in more, more families than they ever have before. So that was a significant bump. I think another significant bump that I'll talk about a little bit later was housing. So we had a lot of families that were housed in hotels in the county. They get to stay for their entire year. They had house, permanent housing in the city this summer and they all transferred to us. So that, that, those were two big bumps. Um, people have asked about Ukraine and 
The way that families come from Ukraine is through um, different organizations like churches and other um, nonprofits. And so they won't come in necessarily through the International Rescue Committee. They might be able to support them when they do come. So we will probably, we don't have any families right now. If we did, it wouldn't be as sis like systematic of a process. For this year, the IRC's numbers were around 285 individuals, so not students. Usually about half of them are students. And then they kind of split between the county and the city. Usually they try to settle the newcomers um, we, in the city because it's less, less need for a car. But right now, all of our families who've come this year have all started out um, in hotels. Yeah. I feel like the next slide is actually super dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted to show you this next slide is, a, is more specific to the schools. So if you look, the total in red there in the middle is where our numbers are. Um, and this is again from August 8th. So when school was starting up before we had new registrations to October 26th. So this is all this year's enrollment change. Um, and this is where we've had, to be do, we've had to do a lot of juggling at the school level to try to figure out how can we better support these students. Uh, the pending enrollments is, is students that there's a enrollment process. So when student families register, they fill out a home language survey. If that indicates a language other than English, then we screen them. So those pending students are students we know about. They might not have been screened yet or the paperwork is working on getting to us. Um, and then you see the total students and the changes since August, as well as the ESL FTEs. And so I highlighted in, in bright red and then with the yellow underneath it, where my concerns are in terms of our schools. And so you can see that all but three of our schools right now are over our 30 to one ratio that we like to keep. I would love to, I mean, I think Dr. Gurley, just from my perspective as a, I, my concern here is like, not necessarily FTT, FTEs, like, but also like the class size, which I just think mm -hmm. has been made this, the ELLs in the, you know, in a class of 22 to 24 is just makes a very difficult day um, uh, for those students who cannot speak any English. Um, I think they learn quickly. There's a very significant rebound. We talked about that with Dr. I mean, with um, Ms. Tatel. And um, so, but I still, the, the, that's what worries me is like, again, I, I'm just constantly going to be for lower class sizes and more adults in the building because of this reason, because our students have such high needs, like it's not just the ELL learners, like most of our students have a lot of needs that adults hopefully can work with them. Um, but how do you address, like, I, I mean, uh, 23 since August at Jackson Via? I mean, you can't we plan. <laughs> We did move some staffing for that. Jackson Valley started out with one teacher and we have 1.5 now, we, but we had to pull it from Clark, right? So. <laughs> All right, so I'll talk a little bit about implications and impact and then some of the things that we're doing right now. Um, so just like you said, the growth of our uh, multilingual population affects all of our schools, right? And affects all of the staff. Um, and a few areas where I think, first of all, I think our teaching staff has done an incredible job. I mean, just the welcoming, I got to see one first, second grader start at um, Burnley Moran and the teacher had it ready where they had a t-shirt for him and they had a, another little student who came and gave it to him and shook hands and then the whole class clapped. I mean, it was, it was beautiful. So the teachers are doing an incredible job, I think. Um, but I do think that our newcomers who've been in the country for less than a year, their, their language needs are, are great. And so it's really hard for on a classroom teacher um, without the added support. Um, another thing to consider is that we have more students who are older who are coming, so 18 or 19, and their requirements for graduation are the exact same for any student who starts at 14. So that's all of the same classes, passing five verified credits, which means passing the SOL test um, in order to graduate. They can stay until they're 22, but that's a really hard ask when we know that in terms of language development, you need five to seven years to be ready academically. Um, 
Another thing is continued transportation concerns. I am so excited to say that out of we previous to the new transportation list, we had 100 of our of our L's on the wait list, and that's dropped down to 36. So we're continuing to make really good progress. I think there's a, there were some very excited parents and teachers and staff members today when they got the, the news about the transportation. Um, but the other thing that's hard is our families who, who register tomorrow will start out on the wait list, right? So that process isn't quick enough. And so that's hard for families and for students. Um, and then the last piece is about um, housing concerns. So when our families start out um, and they're placed in hotels and they don't have stable housing, there's also their stable housing might up, end up in the city, it might end up in the um, county. And right now, half of the families that we have on McKinney Vento, um, with a, those are families of our, in our ESL program. So it's significantly increasing that program as well. A couple exciting things that are happening. Um, one big shift we've been working on starting last year into this year is moving our registration um, to a district level. Um, this shift allows our families and our organizations we work with like the IRC to have one place they come. And this is especially helpful for families who might have a student at an elementary level, Walker and Buford. So they come to one place, we're able to help gather those documents. We're able to screen them for their language so that when they're ready to start school, everything is taken care of. Um, this also gives students the time they, or this also gives, uh, sorry, this also gives schools back that time because often families would show up in the middle of the school day and that can be a really hectic process when you're trying to help a family register who doesn't speak the same language and everything else that's happening in school is happening. Um, the other uh, positive from this is our ESL teachers don't need to take time from their instructional day to screen students so they don't have to change their, constantly change their schedules for screening. They are constantly changing their schedules as new students come, but that's a given. Um, so the, and, and then we're hoping that this will also build on our family engagement work. And so we have uh, federal funding that can, we can use for family engagement and having that first touch point with families and meeting them for the first time can help build that, um, that relationship. So we're excited about that. We're currently open two days a week and we're right downstairs where most of you walked through. We use that space and then the conference room space. All right, so our next steps. Um, in September and October, during our division professional uh, development days, we offered sessions for teachers on how to better support multilingual learners. We had over 200 teachers come to the different events. They were all on Zoom. Um, but I think that also shows that the teachers were really interested and, and asking for more. And so we're excited to try to continue to find different ways that, uh, that teachers can learn more about how to support these students. Um, I do think that the professional learning needs to continue to expand and we need to think about more, more division wide ways that we can do that. Um, so I'm excited about thinking through that with some folks. And another thing I wanted to bring to your attention is our translation and interpretation budget. That's a local budget. Um, we, we can't use Title III funds for that. Uh, and I put in for the budget last October, not knowing about these 200 extra students. And so we're using those translation interpretation funds. And I just wanted to let you know that um, we'll definitely need a budget increase for next year, um, and I'm look, we're looking at ways we can figure it out for the remainder of this year, but that is a, that's a federal requirement that we, that we um, have conversations with families in a language that they understand, so that's really important that we continue to use that. We definitely need to increase our ESL staff this year if possible, but looking forward to next year with our numbers, and then I just want to thank you for your ongoing support for the Welcome Center, and that's it. I had one question mm -hmm. about, um, I was just thinking about um, some of these kids and where they've come from and the trauma that they mm -hmm. must be experiencing or have experienced. And, but are, are we able to are, help them access any of our emotional support or mental health support mm -hmm. services? Seems really hard. We definitely can. So Jody would be able to speak with, to this better, yeah. but when, when students come in, we, we work with them on a tier one level, just like any other student. But if something presents where we might think, oh, they might need some extra support, absolutely, we can, we can have them work with some of our mental wellness um, 
profession professionals or or other people and they have access to and so we have a division level um, access to the language line to interpret talk to have interpreters we also can bring interpreters into the building they have their own separate budget for that as well so while that's not the best solution it, it does work well so we, we can um, use interpreters for those conversations we also want to give students time though because um, regardless of their past and what they've been through some students might be ready to just come to school, go to school, do what they need to do and come home and some students aren't. And so we wanna give them the liberty to be able to let us know if they need more. I'm so grateful that you're here today. Like I feel very grateful that we are, have such a robust leader and that we have um, you know, strong staff working here doing this. I just feel like this community, so grateful for our ELL. Um, students and refugees. So I, I'm, I know that uh, we wanna do the best we can with our students and I'm glad that we have, I don't know that I've ever met you. So I'm very glad to have you here so that I can, um, so that we can understand the importance of the ELL population and the work that y'all are doing in our schools. So thanks. Thank you. I have one. I guess technical question. Yeah. Do you know off the top of your head how many dual identified students we have that are L's mm. and special ed? I do uh, not. Students? You know, that's on my list of things to do because I need to know it before January. Last year, I think it was around 20. Um, I think it's higher this year just from some anecdotal, but I, I could pull that and let you all know Great. for sure. And then I guess to you, Dr. Gurley, what how, what do we have available to us to provide some additional resources where they seem to be clearly needed? So most certainly as we continue to have the conversation about the need, I mean, some of the immediate things could definitely be to look at using some of the one-time funds. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, the downside to that is that if we lean into some of those one-time funds, you know, trying to figure out how to sustain it once the money's gone, um, will be one of those hard and daunting tasks. Um, but I mean, most certainly, um, we have been working very closely with Dr. Fouts and, and the team. And, and so we do want to be able to relieve some of the stress and, and looking at, you know, looking at people's licensure and, and, you know, who's able to, if we can move staff and, and, and do, but I mean, we can find the resources, especially if we look at some of our you know, non-reoccurring funds is just the hard part about that. It's what happens, um, what happens when we, when we don't have access to those funds. Um, because we do, you know, a lot of the conversation is about the student experience. And so we wanna make sure that all students uh, have a, a good experience here. And, and like Ms. McKeever said, it's about the small class size. It's, it's about getting that, that tailored and, and personalized learning and supports that they need. And, and you see the numbers are rising. Um, so we are gonna to have to address it. Optimistically, since we are back in person, we might have more students exit this year. So that might drop our numbers a little. We won't know that till June though. Um, Dr. Platts, um, um, thank you for your um, strong leadership in this program and working with our ESL students and all the great staff you have. Um, I just want to say that I had the um, distinct pleasure of being next door to um, Lisa Morales when I was a counselor here. Mm -hmm. And I can remember, and also what Dr. Crabb said, a lot of the those um, ESL students needed lots of attention. And, um, and um, she was just so embracing and she would, and motherly and took time to listen to their concerns. And, um, and I see a lot of those students out in the community working and uh, also at PVCC and doing well. So I'm hoping that we will continue to get adequate funding so the numbers are rising that is a concern um, so that we can make sure that those students that are enrolled here um, get the nurturing that they need, um, the counseling that they need for a lot of them coming from traumatic situations and um, also um, preparation for after high school. Mm -hmm. So that's important. So I have fond memories of seeing a lot of them coming um, to Ms. Morales' room when I was here. So thank you for all you do. We have two CHS um, 
school counselors, Shamika Terrell and, and Jermander Towler, who are working with our L's. And it, that, those doors don't, don't stay closed for long. It's a revolving door over there. So they're doing a great job. Any other questions, comments, Ms. Bird? Do you anticipate expanding um, your welcome center, the days, or is that that's just all? Well, right now it's uh, me and Sherry Stewart. So I think right now we're okay. We haven't we haven't felt like we've needed that. The Tuesdays and Thursdays have been working well, so I think we'll continue with that right now. Um, families register, and then we set up an appointment with them. So I, I think that's working fine. Um, we'll see though. And then if students, um, if their housing changes mid-year, are we, if the students wanna continue and can get to school, are they allowed to stay or, or are we? Yeah, the way it works with McKinney Vento is the family can choose to stay within the city for the, year, the school year. And so if housing changes and they go into the county, they get that choice. Um, and so depending on where they live, they might, um, they might choose to go ahead and transfer to the county or, you know, if it's stable housing and, and they've got a kindergartner and they're planning to stay for several years, it might more, make more sense to be in their neighborhood school, but the families get that choice for the remainder of the school year and they, they would have to change after that. And then we provide transportation. Right. Um, and then for our elementary students who come in and are, and are younger mm -hmm. and they're say they're level one how how do we I mean do we need to get them to a, a certain level before we would start to really look at literacy stuff mm -hmm. to see if there's something else going on or do we ever bring in um, someone who speaks their native language to to kind of screen yeah. them at all? That's a great question. So we do have screeners for Spanish. There aren't very many screeners out there, literacy screeners for other languages, but there are simple screeners that we've created. Like um, our, our Pashto and Daria and our Arabic speakers all use the Arabic script. So even checking with them, do they know the letters in Arabic? Do they know the letter sounds in Arabic? Um, that's something we, we can kind of muddle through. Obviously it's very um, f formative and it's, but it's helpful, right, to know so we can use things like that. There isn't a set time, I think especially when you think about decoding, right? There isn't a set time that we would want to wait. So if a, however, we know that literacy is connected to comprehension and language, right? And so we wanna make sure a lot of our programs that we use, a lot of the good um, structured literacy that we use with our reading specialists wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for a newcomer because, um, there isn't as much connection or time to really focus on, well, what is this meaning of this word too? And we need that to be connected from the beginning. But a lot of our ESL teachers have gone through the letters training. And I think more, you know, we encourage that, that they build their understanding of foundational literacy skills as much as they can um, so, that, so that they can help. And, and there's constant conversations at schools about even our newcomers, if they're seeing maybe they're not picking up their letter names and sounds as quickly. What are some interventions I can do as an ESL teacher to really help them? Um, and so we do try to keep an eye on that from the beginning. Language learning and literacy, it's, it's harder to learn a second language, to learn how to read in a second language if you haven't learned how to read in your first language. And so we do expect a little bit more time with our elementary students, whereas a lot of times our secondary Walker Buford and the high school students their, their, that transition will happen really fast because they know how to read in their first language. There's so much that can transfer so many of those skills that they'll pick it up quicker. So we, we kind of have some expectations, but we do keep an eye on kids as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Okay, the next um, agenda item is our board response to written reports and there um, that included school board member committee reports and also our uh, current pupil teacher ratio and our next uh, opportunity for comments from members of the community is now. Um, so if there's anybody who would like to speak again, please come up and limit yourself to three minutes, please. Tanisha Hudson again. As you all can see, parents can't do this. So sitting here three hours to voice your opinion about what's going on with your child, 
a, a, a single parent, they can't do this. Like there has to be a better way, number one. Number, and it's just so many things I just, I gotta say, because um, one, the solar. Um, one, you're doing a school reconfiguration and you're about to spend money on LED lights. I just think from a cost efficient standpoint, I'll come back for another meeting. I'm not gonna waste my time on that. Um, reading levels. Um, when she was going over the reading levels, it's evident at this point that black kids are struggling because they're not reading things that are intriguing to them. And she used a word that really stood out to me. She said, um, systematic. The definition of systematic is done or acting according to a fixed plan or system, methodical, an established form of procedure. We all know that when this school system was built, it was not built for people that look like me. Black people were not able to read. So you invited us into a system that we're not reading things that, in, that intrigue us, that engage us, that keeps us informed. Even when she just went over the English as a second language, the increase of students that can't speak English, what is your decrease in your students of color how many of your kids are moving out of Charlottesville? How many of your black children or, or BIPOC children are actually displaced from this city and move into surrounding counties? These are things that should really stand out to you all when you talk about equity. And, and Dr. Gurley is big on saying equity is an uh, action, not a word. That, that's something you have to be paying attention to. You gotta read in between this data that you're using that you're looking at, that you're using eventually to get budget requests or whatever you're asking for from the federal government. You have to pay attention to what's really happening in Charlottesville. I went to school here, I graduated here. There's been a, a huge movement that has happened. And even when she went over the reading levels and the percentages, you can see even in the numbers, the, the overall percentage of students that the black student body is down right now. Back to the main issue that I came here for is your issue with your teachers and your students of color. She also brought up something else about um, the cultural learning or the cultural training. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, who is providing the oversight to know how your white teachers are engaging with your BIPOC students? Who's providing that oversight? Because I don't think there's much oversight happening as to how people are engaging. We, 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 we see the numbers. Your white students are doing exceptionally well. They're very well represented. Even in this room, they are very, very well represented. And black people are not very well represented, not even in your classrooms. There's not that many black teachers in the city of Charlottesville or Albemarle County or any other school system in this region. It's just not that many black teachers. They're not coming to a place like Charlottesville. They're just not. Your pay is not that well. They're going to area cities or states where they're gonna get paid more money. Your bus driver issue, you have 10 bus drivers, 10. That affects more kids of color than your white students. So when we talk about equity or we wanna point out the inequities, I think I've named enough for all of you to go back and do some homework to really pay attention to what's happening in the school system. It's a lot of issues here, a lot. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. Mr. Como, anybody on Zoom? All right, we will close comments from members of the community um, and move on to comments from the board. Dr. Kraft. I was just wondering if this is Allison's last meeting. Do you have one more? Okay, so I don't have to say goodbye to you. <laughs> Okay, uh, I don't have anything. Just just to note for the public that our our uh, Virginia School Board Association meeting is coming up this month in Williamsburg, and most of us will be there for a few days, and hopefully we'll bring back some uh, good ideas. 
Ms. Dooley? No. Mr. Bryant? Ms. Morseberger? Oh, I just wanted to add and kind of echo what um, was said earlier about our budget. Um, as we go into our budget season this year, I hope that we are, we'll do an equitable budget um, and take a look at all of our programming and all of our needs. Um, tonight, we talked about literacy, we talked about English language learners, um, and there's just, um, when it comes to our budget, our priorities need to be reflected in the budget to make sure that the kids who need the support are getting the supports that they need. Thank you, Ms. McKeever, no? Ms. Bird. Um, I have the results of my Bullying Prevention Month survey if you all are interested. Um, before I begin, I would like to mention the fact that I did not get as many responses on the survey as I was hoping that I was going to get considering it was um, given out to all students on the BKT Canvas page um, as an announcement. Um, so with that in mind, interpret the, interpret the results considering that the surveyed sample might not be entirely representative. Um, less than half of students surveyed reported no, not knowing anyone. So the majority of students surveyed said that they did know someone that has been bullied at, uh, at CHS. Um, and more specifically, about 30% of students said that they knew or may have known someone cyber bullied specifically at CHS. Only 4.5% of polled students said that CHS staff were doing enough to keep students safer and more secure and, and secure from bullying. And finally, 87% of students polled said that other students weren't doing enough um, to keep everyone safe and secure from bullying. Uh, in terms of like uh, the open-ended suggestions that I got, um, they were, the, I didn't get many, but they were uh, pretty universally related to lack of communication. Um, some reported facing discrimination re related to transphobia, ableism, racism, and others. Um, the biggest suggestions I got were to increase communication about bullying between students and staff and improve education about discrimination along with creating a more inclusive environment. Um, I also took the liberty to have conversations with my friends and my classmates. Um, and I was shocked by the number of my classmates who had no idea that bullying was present at CHS at all, let alone the degree to which it is. Um, so clearly it, it isn't really talked about. Um, it's definitely not enough considering how many students it affects. And so I, I think it's clear just that the communication isn't sufficient there. Thank you. That's all. And feel free, I don't know if it's easy. I, I would love if you could email those to the board. If anybody else is interested, I would love to just kind of have a copy of that, please. Any other comments? All right. I just want to say thank you to staff, and um, I think um, that's it for me, Dr. Gurley. Um, I just want to thank everyone. Um, I want to thank our, um, our staff. I want to thank our staff members for all that they do. Um, we've been in schools, um, been in classrooms, and, and just um, we just see a lot of engaged students, and we see teachers. Um, teachers and reading specialists and math specialists and we just see people doing doing the work and we are very appreciative of that and um, and I just want to um, I know Miss Hudson did not stay around and she left so I will reach out to her um, I'll reach out to her tomorrow or shoot her a text message this evening but um, I do welcome people um, you know to come to me um, with their concerns and I, you know, I heard her speak of equity and action and some of the things that I just think that people, you know, I think she is, um, she has a very powerful voice and these are all things that I've said to her, she has a very powerful voice and I think that um, we do need to leverage voices like that. And I think with that being said, just making sure that people know that we have texts that look like our students. Um, I mean, when we're in our classes, we see brown students reading books with brown children in the books. 
Um, so I just think that people need to see, um, people need to see what our students are reading, what they have access to. And then we have to also make sure that we are um, just being voices for people who don't have a voice. Um, and we appreciate that. So I will follow up with uh, um, parents who were um, present this evening. And, um, and, and we, we, we're, we are a place um, and I just, you know, the last thing we we did, did do the Better Together survey and we I heard some voices from teachers. And so I just want to make sure that you'll get the personal follow ups and and things. But this is a place where every voice will be heard. And just thank you all. Um, thank you all for everything. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Um, work session wrap up. Do we have anything? One. Unless, unless I missed one, but I had one about um, the number of duly identified um, L students to report back to that number. Okay, thank you. Um, upcoming meetings, we have, um, as Dr. Kraft said, November 16th through 18th, our annual conference, and then our next uh, regularly scheduled meeting will be December 1st at five o'clock here in the Media Center. And we are going to adjourn here and go back into closed session. So thank you very much.